I'm Paul Bissonette, and you're listening to the Nasty Knuckles Podcast. You're listening to Nasty Knuckles, the Hockey Outlaws Podcast, with your host, Terry Nasty Sotomayor and former Philadelphia Flyer Enforcer Riley Cote as they go behind the scenes with your favorite NHL players. Time to face off. All right, welcome back. What's happening, Nasty? What's up, Riggs? We made it. We made it. One hundo, man. Oh, yeah. Can't believe it, dude. I can't believe it. I honestly can't believe it. <laughs> like, like, where'd the time go? Uh, I can't. No, seriously, man. This is awesome. I'm, uh, I can't believe we made it to 100, man. Yeah. Yeah, to think uh, we start, started two and a half years ago and <laughs> obviously spawn out just an idea, but right. to, to, to roll with it and stick with it and, and grind it out. Grind. Lots of lots of grinding. Lots of grinding. Lots of, grinding. lots of fun. Yes, tons of fun. fun. This has been awesome. I just I still can't even believe it. Yeah. Everyone's like messaging and talking about it. I'm like, I know, I don't I just it it seems like it's been a while, but then again it doesn't. I mean I remember the first day, you know, our, you know, our first yeah. guest was Scott Hartnell. He's been three, but I guess he's not anymore because I these nuts him. Yeah. But uh <laughs> he's, not coming, yeah, back. he's <laughs> not coming back. Third and final time. <laughs> he That's said. It. But uh man, it's, it's been so much fun and uh doing it with you and Baller, Debo, and um, everyone else that's helped out. A lot of people have helped yeah. out with us. So, man, this has just been great. Yeah. Yeah, it's been a lot of fun, and I feel like we're just getting going next. I do too, man. Uh, I do big too. announcement. Huge announcement. Yeah. So, I'll let you have it. Yeah, you let me have it? I'm going to let you. Well, you were dropping the middies more than me. All right. All so right. you've been on there more times than me. I have. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah you, you might have been in the background. Yeah, yeah I was I'm probably in the background. Yeah. I'm like shadow Picking boxing. up my gloves yeah. and my helmet. Uh, but uh, happy to announce a partnership with HockeyFights.com. Unbelievable. And their umbrella network, nation network um, that we're going to be um, joining. So... Uh, so pumped obviously man. more distribution more eyes and uh, nasty knuckles just fits in the hockey fights it does uh, calm uh umbrella so sure does to, um join and um and con- continue to push out the content and and expand on it I think yes expand of uh creative ventures that spawn from this relationship so we're just getting started and uh, happy to announce it with the with that announcement as well as uh, our, our guest today Yes. Paul Bissonette. Biz Nasty. Biz whoa, nasty. whoa, whoa. Who was called Nasty first? That's you the one. You are I, the OG Nasty. Okay. You are the, the original. I'm old. You are, you <laughs> That's old. for sure. You are old. But uh, no, man, so pumped to have Biz on. Can't yeah. wait. Yeah, man. Uh, for sure. And, I, you know, we talked about having this episode be very meaningful and bringing on, you know, the best guests we could find. And yep. between Biz and Greta. I know. Sorry, Gratz. <laughs> yeah, sorry, Gratz. <laughs> Wait, we had to decline. No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. kid. Totally kidding. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, like Biz is what he's done since he finished playing hockey, yeah, man. man, is amazing. The guy is he's he's really good at what he does. He's great at what he does. And yeah. just a good dude too. We've known him for a while and yeah. um can't say enough good things about him. Can't wait to get him on here. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, lots of good stuff happening. Lots of momentum. Nast, you know, you talk about you know paying it forward and grinding, and you know things pay off. Uh, it's been fun. You know, you gotta have fun doing this type of stuff. Obviously, there's a lot of competition in the podcasting world. There's a lot of eyes on every other podcast. Yeah, it's tough to it's tough to get going, but uh, happy we started and stuck with it because there's been definitely some adversity that we faced. That, yes, you know, we wanted to pump the brakes and. Yeah, pack her in, but um, you know for sure. Whoa. And you know what's amazing is when we talked to Jay, um, you know hockeyfights.com and, and uh, Nation Network. One of the first things he told us was eighty percent of podcasts don't make it past five. Yeah, I know, and really, that was, was an amazing number to me. And uh, somehow you've been able to put up with me a hundred times. Yeah, plus everything else. Everything else. <laughs> <laughs> been a lot of fun man. yeah it's awesome yeah so good stuff well moving on well i know we what got... you want to talk about because you're canadian let's talk about the world juniors it's uh, been exciting it's been, it's been very exciting. Exciting. Very exciting um your boy bedard's okay he's okay yeah <laughs> just just average jeez 
My God. Kid's pretty special, man. No. Like, this first time, I've seen highlights of him. Obviously, everyone has. But, like, to watch him play all these games in a row, like, he... He's a special player, man. He's a, you know, he's not very big, but I don't think it matters. He's elite, elite, elite status. Yes, he I mean, is. He will eventually be the best player in the world. I you mean, think so? I think so. I mean, I know it's early to say, yeah, but like, there's so many things he does that are just like way beyond even elite players at that level do. Yeah, I mean, his release is insane. It is. His vision, his eyes. I don't even think he ever looks down. Right. I mean, it's insane. I mean. It, I don't yeah. know. I mean, it's a little bit early of a prediction there, but uh, you said it's special. I mean, there's something extremely special about this kid, and whoever gets the luxury of grabbing him first overall, you build your franchise around this day, Yo. and you ride, you ride him. Um, yeah, so for sure. Amazing. He obviously. Uh, setting records. Setting records, yeah, yeah. Incredible. I mean, What's the stats on that? He's uh, 17 goals, I guess that. He passed Eric Lindros in points. Yes. Um, Eberle in goals, I believe, had had the most goals. Yep. But he's got 17 goals, 35 points in his World Junior uh, games that he's played. And that sets a record. And and he's got one more to yeah, go. I know, right? So <laughs> who knows what he does in this gold medal game. But uh, I'm glad the Americans were able to, to grab the uh, bronze at least. Yeah. Um, we won't get into uh, <laughs> the third goal that... Yeah. I mean, I no one likes people making excuses. That game, they could have lost anyway, but I feel yeah. like that third goal was a goal. The, yeah. one, the, the, the one they took away later in the game, I felt when the... When the yeah, that one seemed the, to be a little more clear That's, that's fine. Yeah, I was fine with that. But when the game goes to 3-3, I, I would have liked to seen it play out yeah, there. But I whatever. Know, right? It yeah. is what it is. Yeah. Our good buddy, uh, Sam Gagne, who played here for a year, I really enjoyed him. Um, just yeah. played his 1,000th game. Want to send a congrats out to Gags, man. Like, a yeah. great guy. What a career, man. Still going. Yeah. Um, happy for him, man. I really, really enjoyed him here. Funny, funny guy. Real lippy. It yeah. was funny when he was here. You know, like, he's obviously a skilled player, not soft by any means. Uh, it was funny because when he was here, the boys used to, like, other guys that were skilled, they were all checking their fight card. <laughs> uh, and, you know, a guy's like, I have six. I think at that time, uh, he probably has more now, but... um. Just really enjoyed him and, and happy for him. Want to congratulate him on his thousandth game. Yeah, a thousand games, no joke. It's awesome. That's a grind. That is a grind, man. The meat suit to hold up for a thousand D- NHL games is, yeah, is impressive. Yeah, and I have to say this. I met Sam when he was 18. It was his rookie year in Edmonton. Mm. And guess where I met him? In Philadelphia, in a place you're very familiar with. We used to go on Sunday nights. Oh, my God. McDaniels? He was in McDaniels. You might have been there with you. You, pro- oh, well, you had to have been, yeah, actually. Yeah, definitely was there. Uh, uh, remember, Rolson, like, the whole team was yeah, there. Yeah, Rolson right. and, and this guy sitting there, and I'm that's like, great. I go over and I sit, you know, say, hey to him, what's up, man? What's your name? He's like, Sam. And I'm like, oh, shit, okay. This is Sam Gagne. Yeah. And I'm like, you're 18. Yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> he's, he's, you look like he was 50 oh, yeah. um, but yeah I, you know so it was it was pretty funny that and then he ends up signing here and it was pretty cool we kind of talked about that but uh, anyway congrats yep gags yep. that's a it's a hell of a career it's man a still going yeah, still going still going strong anything else going on any other high performers oh tage thompson oh my god sticks a little hot huh 30 he G's in 36 games. Hey, this guy shoots from anywhere, but he's got, man, they're, they're nice. Missile. It is. Yeah. And the one timers and like, man, him and Ovi were going at it the other night. And, uh, you know, I think Tage ended up with the game winner in overtime and he had a hat trick, but man, 30 goals in 36 games. If he keeps that up, that that's, that's going to be insane numbers, yeah, but, uh, it. it's kind of fun to watch. Yeah. It's fun to watch, man. Yeah. Yeah. That's, uh, that's impressive. And what else we got? Is this Toby trivia? Yes, we do. We have. Uh, uh, before we get to the Toby trivia, I have a little bit of a surprise. Oh boy! Oh man! Oh boy, baller! Um, do you not know head over to the YouTube right now? If your television wants to work, there help? we go. Did you do it already? Do you know? Are you yep. there? We're in here. Um, before we get going, I want to thank everybody who helped me with this. Took a little time out of their day. Hopefully this is loud enough. Nasty Knuckles. Uh-huh. It's G and Gavin. Just want to say that we uh, we love listening to you guys. Nasty and Riles doing a, a great job. Congrats on 100 episode. Uh, you guys are killing it. Keep it going. Uh, we're going to keep listening. And I uh, can't wait to see you guys again. See you guys. 
Noobs. Oh, look at this guy. Coach Nasty, Mike Knubel here. Just congratulate you guys on 100 episodes of Nasty Knuckles. It's awesome. Hope you have 100 more. And Nasty, anytime you want to bring your game to G Rep, I know you're a baller at heart. We go one on one, buddy. Have a good day, boys. Oh, hey, so Nasty good. and Riles, congratulations, boys, on 100 episodes of the Nasty Knuckles pod. That's pretty impressive. I don't know why it's called Nasty Knuckles. Nasty, have you ever thrown a punch in your life? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if you oh, know things around, though. No, I'm saying. Okay. Uh, another 100 coming up, boys. Impressive. Congrats. Keep on rolling, baby. <gasps> yeah. No, don't put it. What do you got? That is this is 25 years since we did that. Hey, guys, G Mac here, Nasty Riles. I just wanted to say, hey boys, congratulations on 100 episodes. Don't worry about it. it was the cats. You know they were getting into stuff, something like that. Was not me. I was here to congratulate you guys on 100 episodes. Man. Also, too nasty. Uh, I'm not sorry. I told you is when I uh, talked to you before is. Uh, Go talk to Ron Hextall, but uh, it's great getting to know you. Love what you do with Nasty Knuckles. Um, look forward to uh, adventures in the future. Riley Cote, my man, I owe you a lot, my brother. Um, just I'm just over seven years sober and on this journey. Their McCarty brand um, will be coming hot and heavy here in 2023, and I owe it to you because you were the first of the brothers that – uh, picked me up and got me on this journey. So to you, That's awesome. uh, my utmost loyalty, you know, uh, we've talked about it. So couldn't be prouder to both you and your families, to your crew, because it goes to Travis and everybody behind the scenes, everybody doing it. I know this too. Um, it takes, it takes an army and that Philly army. I love, uh, that's why I'm doing the deathmatch wrestling. Hey, another story, guys. <laughs> Give me a call for the next 100 episodes. Anyways, congratulations, guys. Love you. From Detroit, DMAC out. Hey, guys. Diamond Dave McCarthy here. Uh, Riles and Nasty, I just wanted to congratulate you guys on your 100th episode. Keep it going, boys. Go Flyers. Hey, Riles and Nasty. Oh. Congratulations on 100 episodes. Keep up the good work. Wish you all the best. Hey, Nasty Knuckles. <laughs> Marty Baron here. How are you guys doing? I know I'm wearing my Bills stuff. Don't worry, Eagles fans. I still love the Eagles. Uh, but with everything that's happening here in Buffalo, um, that's what I uh, do to support. Um, obviously, Damar Hamlin and everything that's happened. But anyway, uh, neither here or there. Big episode of Nasty Knuckles. 100. Listen, Riles, you know, uh, you start with one and you knock them down one by one. Uh, you've been able to do that in your career many times. You score a few goals, practice goals on me too, buddy. So I'm glad I could help you out in that department. And Nasty, you always took care of me. Uh, you helped me put all the tape around my ankles for, you know, a couple of years plus. That's a lot of tape. It'd probably be, uh, you know, a couple of miles of tape over two, three Easily. years that I used. So Easily anyway, there. congratulations. Love it. I uh, love what you guys do. Always bring up a good pers uh, perspective and some fun bits, great guests, uh, because you guys are great hosts. So uh, anytime you need me, I'll always be happy to jump on. Uh, but congratulations on 100 episode. See you guys. Hey, Nasty. Hey, Riley. Uh, congrats on 100 episodes of Nasty Knuckles. Uh, keep it up. Keep it going. It's, it's a lot of fun to listen to. Cheers, guys. What's up, everybody? It's Jason oh, Martinez going, from the Stick to Hockey Live studios, as you can see. And I want to send some severe congratulations, serious congratulations to the two, two of the best, Riley Cote, the Knuckles, and the nasty Derek Settlemeyer. And congrats on 100 episodes of one of my favorite podcasts to watch and listen to. You guys do a fucking awesome job and keep it going, boys. Great job getting to 100 episodes. And I was proud to be a guest on Nasty Knuckles. Nast. Riles. <laughs> Rhino. Rhino here. Probably don't fucking recognize because of the beard. Just want to say congratulations on 100 episodes. I'm so proud of you guys. I'm very thankful and grateful to call you guys friends. Um, you've done a lot for me in my career. So uh, I thank you both for everything you've done. Congratulations on 100 episodes. Can't wait for 100 fucking more. 
Hey Riles, Nasty, it's uh, Schultze here. Just want to send a message to say congrats on uh, 100 episodes of uh, Nasty Knuckles. Keep up the great work. Love listening to the pod. Loved uh, being a guest on it. Keep it going, boys. Hey Nasty. Hey Riles. Just want to wish you guys congratulations on 100 episodes of the Nasty Knuckles. <laughs> All right, boys, keep it going. And good luck the rest of the way. Nasty coach, Gratz here. Congrats on the hundredth episode, fellas. Very entertaining. Keep up the good work. Maybe get a live show going at our old stopping grounds, McDaniel's. Definitely would love that one. Talk to you soon, boys. Cheers. A pleasant good day. I don't know whether it's afternoon or evening, so I'll just say good day. Nasty and Riley. One hundred episodes of Nasty Knuckles. Congratulations. Quite a milestone. And I'm honored to say I snuck in under the wire. I'm one of the first 100 of those episodes, and you guys got me to tell some stories I probably shouldn't have told, and I'm sure you, <laughs> you get that out of most of your guests. But congratulations, 100 episodes, that's great. Congratulations, obviously, in order, but we look ahead to your next 100 or your next 200 or your next 1,000 or 10,000 or how many ever episodes of Nasty Knuckles you choose to produce. Great stuff. Proud of you guys. Happy for your success, and keep it up. Riles Nasty, congrats on 100 oh. episodes. Uh, love the pod. Nasty Knuckles has got us through a lot of road trips. So, congratulations again. Love you guys. That's awesome. Uh, thanks, thanks Paul. That's Appreciate fucking awesome. Yeah, that's Debo. That's great, man. Pretty rad. Pretty rad. Yeah. <laughs> Carter, Carter had his hair slicked. He looked good. Eh? Yeah. Yeah, they, well, it, it didn't look like Ellen there, though. No, it did not. <laughs> it did not. <laughs> Amazing. That's awesome. well, appreciate it. Yeah, appreciate that Debo. baller. Debo. Everyone else that was involved in making that happen is uh, pretty special. Yeah, that's awesome, man. Yeah. So well, now, Tovi Trivia. Tovi Trivia what brought you to you next? by Tovi Hockey. Obviously. Uh, here's the question. And, baller, the first person to answer this on the YouTube channel, correct, wins a Nasty Knuckles hat. Which three players played in the 2010 Winter Classic in Boston and the 2023 I know. Winter Classic. I do, too. Should I answer? Nope. No. Well, We're going to we'll get a winner and send them a hat. Make sure you comment in our YouTube yes. channel, YouTube page. Hit subscribe if you're not subscribed. All right. Good plug there, Nast. Yeah, you know. Well, Nast, you know, it is that time. I we believe it is. We are ready to rock episode 100 with our man, Paul Bissonnette, a.k.a. Biznassi, the one and only. Yes. Creative genius. Presented to you by Cureleaf. Welcome to Cureleaf, a medical marijuana dispensary. Whether you're a longtime patient or you're just getting acquainted with this incredible plant, Cureleaf of Pennsylvania is honored to guide you along your medical marijuana journey. Have questions? Google Cureleaf PA or stop by one of their 18 locations across the Commonwealth or visit cureleaf.com forward slash locations. Nast. It's time. It's time. Let's go. Let's do it. Welcome back. I'm Riley Cote. And I'm Derek Settlemeyer. And this week, I don't even have a word to express how excited we are, except for we're very excited to have, I believe, the master of media. Yes. Creative genius, former NHL player, tough guy, did it all. Not to mention a two-time All-Star, ECHL, <laughs> TNT analyst, a Calder Cup champion. Please welcome Mr. Biz Nasty, Paul Bissonette. Biz, thank you so much for joining us, man. Nasty. Those those intros are not easy, buddy. I appreciate the tire pump. I always fumble <laughs> fuck them, and that's why we let RA take care of it. So you're you're doing you're doing the greasy work on the pod. And uh congratulations, boys. A hundred podcasts. And I was thinking, well, not only is it such an honor to be on this with you guys, but uh I think that most podcasts only make it to like five or eight episodes. That was a, like a stat that Grinelli uh, was talking to us about. So the fact that you guys have kept hammering away and uh, getting these awesome interviews, man, keep fucking going. Congratulations on everything and well deserved. Thank Thanks, you. brother. Thanks, yeah, brother. you've been a huge inspiration. Honestly, you're the, yep. the I say the pioneer in 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 the the media podcasting world, and uh, you know we've been watching afar long before we even started. But it was like this this itch, this call to to do something, uh, you know, somewhat in line with what you're doing. Uh, and, and much respect to you because yes. you've you kind of created a you know a lane of your own a, a niche uh, 
in 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 the in the I'll say specifically the hockey world, but uh, it's pretty pretty impressive what you've done, man. Yeah, it's it's also fun to just keep in touch with the guys, eh? Like, yes, just, yeah. that the one thing you miss is the camaraderie in the locker room, and like, I think that like that's kind of the for me it was one of the last things that I realized that I was missing so bad. Where like when I got back into it and like just having the interviews and like talking to somebody who, especially like some guys, like, they they have these stories that you're like, holy fuck, this is cr-. like we had Tim Stapleton on. He was talking about the KHL shit. Like, yeah, <laughs> it, it just re- reminds you reminds you how much you miss being in a locker room and and, and snapping around with the guys and uh, yeah, it's uh, it's it, it was great, man. And it, it takes an army too, right? It's it, I, it really it was R. A. Grinnell and Wit who started it first. The idea stemmed from me and Wit when we were doing a PTO together in St. Louis, and the concept was as you would bring your uh, your gear with a six pack in it, and you'd go to the locker room. It'd be a YouTube show. And you just open up the bag and you'd fucking crack a beer and you'd start telling stories and you never actually even put your fucking gear on. It was just more about <laughs> snapping around. So that was what we were talking about on this PTO with St. Louis. And when he sent that original tweet out to me and Colby Armstrong about doing a podcast, I didn't know what the fuck podcasts were. I had no clue. Even after he sent that tweet out, I'd never listened to a podcast for probably a, another year and a half, two years. Wow. So just where wow. the whole whole world has moved, and it's also nice too because we both know like when you when you get too big, all of a sudden the words and and what dialogue starts getting controlled, and then it becomes a little bit un- unauthentic, and it's just like this is you know doing you know nasty knuckles or chicklets or you know missing curfew or whatever it is like it's just nobody's fucking telling you guys what to say or to talk or what to ask these guys. And it's just very raw and authentic. So the more the merrier, and it's great to see other people branching out and doing it too. Yeah. It's been, it's been a lot of fun. Like you said, like that, that locker room, that camaraderie, just touching base with the guys. Uh, it, it keeps you connected to the game. And obviously for you, it's evolved much further than that right now. You're on TNT and now you're engaging with guys and a whole nother level, but um, I, I guess one of the questions we wanted to ask, like, and you kind of already maybe touched on a little bit was like your, your plan when you retired, like, did you have any of this in your, in, in your, in your vision or just, just kind of organically fell on your lap? And as you just mentioned with the, with wit and the, the PTO. Yeah. So, so no, not really, but, uh, I always go back and I've been asked this on other podcasts. So first of all, great question. Um, when I, uh, I started Twitter when I was playing with the coyotes and obviously I, I felt that that grown enough to where I could use that as a tool. But the biggest thing was probably after I was done with the coyotes, when I got like, I didn't resign with them. And then I went on that PTO and next thing you know, like I thought I was at least going to maybe get an AHL deal out of it, but nothing came of it. And it was a fun camp. And all of a sudden I, I was kind of gelling with the St. Louis team. Loved the guys there. Like Rebo was there. They had Steen. They had Otter. They had so many cool guys. And, you know, I, I kind of had that hope. At least I would get to stay in the organization. And who knows if, if you know, Rebo fucking maybe, you know, it's hurt. Maybe I get called up for a couple weeks. Who knows? Not saying I'd want that to happen, but you guys know what I'm saying. Like they're still yeah. a ship in a chair, so to speak. So I go, I go back home to Welland and, and I couldn't even get a fucking AHL deal. So I went into this massive, massive depression for like three weeks. Like just like can't really describe it where it's like, like it it was like your livelihood had been stripped from you. Listen, ended up being fortunate where um, Arizona ended up finally signing me to a PTO to go down. But what it did was that experience scared the fuck out of me for the end of my career. Mm -hmm. So I knew that from that experience and then being given that second chance, I ended up going to play another three years in the American league. And that year where I was on my coach depressed, I ended up winning the Calder cup with the Manchester Monarchs. Massive. Thank you to Mike Fuda and, and, and uh, coach Stuthers. I mean, I think, you know, Stutzy. Yeah, I know Stutzy just, well. And the, and the group of guys there, the organization, um, Dean Lombardi, bro, they, they fucking brought me from a very dark place to a very, to a very happy and fortunate place. So, but it was that experience that I knew when I, when it finally came to an end that I had to hit the ground running and you had to fucking take the initiative. And, and that was the case. So it was a sick fear based thing. Hmm. So then finally in my last year, I ended up tearing my, both of my ACLs, my left and my right playing with the Ontario rain. I started setting up the pieces where, um, there was an opportunity to be the coyotes radio guy. 
So I agreed. I was like, yes, I'm going to come back and be the radio guy. And, and that's a great landing spot. I'm familiar with the area and it's a, I get to fucking do it with Bob Heathouse. But from being in the organization with the Kings, Brant Myers has explained to me, like, ex- start your own LLC. So I start, so what I told the Coyotes, I was going to come back, start my media career with them. I got the Twitter kind of background where I can freelance a li- little bit there, but not be tied down to one thing. Mm. And then, and then when I, after I agreed to that and I had that security blanket that summer, I dove into that biz does BC, BC project. Yeah. <clears throat> that taught me everything I needed to know about being in front of the camera, editing, getting guys involved in just. And, and so, but the reason after I retired, why I hit the ground running that first summer and did that project and funded it myself and kept my options open as far as like starting an LLC and taking all that media stuff, that, that was the most beneficial thing that w- was taught to me was that, uh, the, the being scared shitless. So no, I didn't have an idea what it was going to be and what the vision was is I knew that I was just going to grind. I was going to say no to nothing. And taking that, like that, that fear I had of being back on the couch, I said, do you want that? Or do you want the fear of people saying you landed on your flat on your face by funding your own project and, and putting yourself out there and seeing where it could take you from a media perspective. Don't be like everybody else. Go do it how you want to do it. And then that's how it all began. That gave me my confidence. Like, obviously sometimes, you know, you fucking try things and you, and you miss and, I just, I've always been okay with doing that because I I've seen the other side of like what it's like not having anything to do. Yeah. Right. Super powerful. So I hope man. I, yeah. I hope Super. I summarize that properly as like, so like the, the long answer of like, no, I didn't know what it was going to be or, or how it was going to turn out. I just didn't so to, no, say no to anything. And I fucking grinded my dick off. Yeah. You like, did doing logistics, like doing all planning all this editing it doing all that stuff with of course i got to mention my buddy pasha who i filmed that project with he's my guy where he helps out with the sandbaggers now Uh, he we we can just communicate and edit and he can understand the way that the the vision goes like easier right we just kind of see eye to eye we've worked together we're comfortable with each other and those sandbagger videos are a blast i love doing those he also helps out with uh those watson gloves commercials i did Uh, hilarious which we love love. (laughs) which are beautiful so just and you know and and i i want to continue to try to do more of that stuff like i'm trying to like you know, the, you, you, that's like where, where TNT is important. Like I'm trying to figure it out and balance it where it's like, what can I get like production wise, maybe where we can kind of collab and start doing more stuff and getting more access to players. But it's a, it's a, it's a slippery game. And, and, you know, we're, we're associated a bar stool. I'm loyal, like a dog to bar stool because they gave me all creative control to do whatever the fuck we wanted. And that was huge to me. And that's all I ever wanted. And, I understand that sometimes it's in the corporate world, it's not easy to mesh all this shit. And there's a lot of like, you know, contracts and shit involved and I get it, but you know, I'm, I'm going to keep trying to go for like the, the, whatever, like, you know, what, pe- what we think that people want to actually see. Yeah. A hundred percent. And you touched on a couple of things there. One I wanted to mention was, uh, you know, the belief in yourself, right? If, if you don't believe in yourself, who will? And, and you prove that, you know, as a, you know, an amazing thing to teach, you know, the, the youth and, and the younger generation is if you don't believe in yourself, no one's going to believe in you. You know, there's no way to be able to capitalize these ideas and, you know, create what you've created, you know, had you just played it safe or, you know, played it small, um, you know, it, it just proves the concept, obviously, right? It just keeps growing. Um, and then you mentioned like the, the, the creative freedom that you have uh, with, with, Bar, with Barstool and you mentioned the Watsons. One of the things we wanted to ask because those, those commercials are fucking priceless. They are. I mean, I think I've texted you actually after the, maybe that last one. I was just like howling out loud. Um, like how much creative freedom do you have with those when they approach you? Is, 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 this, is, this, is, this, is so, this biz? So we, we, so another guy who is very instrumental in all this happening and getting it to where it needs to be is a guy named Jeff Jacobson. He's my like agent, but he's my best, one of my best friends before he's my agent. And we were friends in Vancouver before 
like before any of this began. So when we do these things, he is helping negotiate the contract and playing the middleman in, a, in essentially explaining like, you need to let us push our boundaries because we're trying to we're trying to do it for our audience. Yes, will there be criticism from other people who don't understand it or don't want that or don't want us to push those boundaries? But like, look at the grand scheme here. This ain't that fucking bad. Me saying me whipping my massive hog all around town, <laughs> living, life in the, living life in the fast lane. It, it ain't that fucking deep, man. Like, right. right. And, and what you're finding is like media is changing so much based on those like 5% of or 3% or 1% of people barking. It's just like, oh my God, what are you doing? You're eating yourself from within. Yeah. So he's been, not only is he helping in the creative of writing the script and what the scene should be. So he helps us cook in, a, in, a, in the lab basically. Yes. And we're going back and forth on lines and, and he's a great writer. So he's really helped with the, the verbiage and, and the direction of that. And, and obviously I don't mind getting in front of the camera and just going back to what you said too, it's like teaching it to the younger generation. Like I don't, I, I don't look at myself as an example. I kind of just, that's why I always explain like it's, it's a, it was a, it was a fear based thing that pushed me to go into the direction of like, do you want to, if that is who you are and you are a creative person, do you want to live with the idea that you never gave it a chance for whatever mm. reason it was, or do you just want to try to attack it? Right. And I'm, I still fight those like, you know, where, where do you bring it? And what am I, how far am I willing to put myself out there? And you, you know, you, you know, you, you, you wonder like what, you know, what you have the time and energy to do in order to execute, to make sure it's actually good. And, you know, so it's, yeah, there's, there's a, it's a, it's a big, strong balance, but like going to the creative side of that, Jeff has been a big help, but, um, like, uh, like going back to the, the, the golf video, the sandbagger, we finally got win that uh, Crosby was willing to come on the Chuck Chuckles podcast. So then in return, obviously Nate McKinnon agreed. So we're like, holy shit, we can go to Halifax. And it, that was a big, huge moment for Chicklets. Like it put us right. to it. People who would have never clicked on us were like Crosby and McKinnon being interviewed by the, what the fuck is going on here? <laughs> so we, <laughs> you know, me being me and, and Pasha being fucking Pasha. Cause he like sneaks into shit. He's a fucking clown. <laughs> he, he, he I, I was like, you know, what about they offered us to go golfing and we're like, Hey, what about like us bringing camera crew on the golf course? And like Sid was trying to be so politically nice about it, but there's like, he's like, I don't want any fucking cameras on the golf course. Like I'm giving you the interview. That's it. So <laughs> we get the interviews, Pasha and them, they clean up all the, the camera work. And, and I'm like, buddy, I think that went so well. Like I'm like, show up to the course, like just. So he fucking shows up about hole three fucking popping out of the woods. With the camp. <laughs> we cut a promo for fucking CCM. Like he's like probably like, what the fuck is going on? And he gets roped into this match all of a sudden. And I'm not a good golfer. And um, and I just for whatever reason that day on the front nine, we'd worked out the handicaps. So we're in a match. I'm getting uh, 18, a shot a hole, and I must have fucking shot like three over on the front. So we're up by five and by hole eight McKinnon is fucking losing it. And <laughs> wit is like, kind of like, bro, like, I don't know if you, cause we never golfed together before like that. So he's like, buddy, uh, he goes, I don't think you're an 18. Like they're going to start calling you a sandbagger. And McKinnon <laughs> heard it from the card ahead. And he's like, he is a fucking sandbagger. What the <laughs> fuck is this shit? Cause I'm going driver to the middle of the fairway and then fucking 120 yards. Boom. Darts on the green, darts on the green, darts on the green, like oh. fucking seven of the eight holes. So all of a sudden, you know, because of our persistence and like our, our, our fearlessness and like Pasha kind of knowing what buttons to push, it ended up turning into that. So just, yeah, I guess be fearless if, 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 if I guess that's kind of the moral of the story. And I, I never want to be like, oh yeah, like I wake up every day and it's just like, I don't know, man, it just kind of happened that way. And sometimes you need that kick in the ass. And that's part of what I'm, I'm also grateful for among like all the other things, right? Like that experience drove me to do that. Sometimes that experience drives people to be go the other way, the fucking dark way. And it sucks, man. And it's like, ultimately you gotta, you gotta kick yourself in the ass and get going. 
That's it. Yeah, you said it, man. The fearlessness is 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 the essence. There's opportunity, all kinds of opportunity lying on the other side of fear, right? It's like you play it safe and you know, if, you know, hide behind the fears. Uh, you know, I did this in a sense with the fighting in hockey, right? It was like this fear of failure, fear fear of letting my parents down, fear of you know all this stuff, right? And it was like I was fighting out of fear. I look back at my career, I was like, this is you know, I was fighting out of fear, survival. Uh, but however, you know, my, 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 you know, insignificant hockey career, it put me where I needed to be in life to be able to do, you know, what I say Fuck more off. important work. Insign- <laughs> How many games you play? Uh, 163. Buddy, I was 202, but you were probably up for what? Four or five years before like four years. Yeah. Yeah. Buddy. Uh, it, it, but, but I completely get what you're saying is like, you fell in love with the game and obviously like you're, you're that the fear and then like also like your intelligence and like you're like this is how i have to adapt to keep going and getting there and bro it's fucking yeah i I guess like looking back like (laughs) it's funny you say that i've never really looked about it but from a fear standpoint you're right that that is why i was fighting yeah it's interesting i never really put a finger on it when i was doing it because it was just like i was just chasing my dream right it was like i need to i need to you know figure this thing out but it, it was fighting out of fear, right? And it was a lot, a lot of different fears there. It's just like how many people are letting down yourself, um, you know, just like, you know, what's next? You know, it's like to your point of like sitting on the couch. It's like it's like you, you got to literally fight your way out of this. And th- that was, you know, where it was coming from, at least at least for me. Um, yeah, or you're fucking 23 and you're like, I need to completely think of a new career path. Well, that, yeah, <laughs> that yeah. ain't easy if you've Not only easy. known one, one thing your whole life. And I, you know, to go to the, like to the, the, the struggling side of it is I think that that regardless, even sometimes of, of financials and money, yeah. there's a lot of guys like, yeah, there, there are a lot of some guys who made 70 sheets and they can go golfing five days a week and everything's taken care of. But for, but even in some cases, those guys, they need a purpose and they need to figure out what to do next. And sometimes for some guys that, that's very difficult to find and it, and it drives them to a dark place. So you just go, yeah, it's, 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 it's the unfortunate side of it all. Yeah, it really I, is. Yeah. I, I, uh, you know, I, I was in the game for 26 years and, you know, I got handed a little bit of a raw deal and I was obviously I was a pigeon equipment guy. I wasn't a player like you guys, but it's all I knew for 26 years, you know, every day going to the rink, being with the boys, having the coffee, all the shit. We always talk about the fun stuff that you miss. I didn't know what to do. And I was in, you know, like Riles could tell you, I, I was the same way and, you know, had to figure out what I was going to do. And, you know, your routine did. too. You t- yeah, I mean, routine, yeah, hundred percent. The, the, the camaraderie, the having to wake up every morning and you got this purpose and you're also being part of a team nasty. Like that's another yeah. fucking thing. Like that's like, that kind of pumps the endorphins to a, to a different level, the natural <laughs> ones anyway. Yeah. 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 yeah <laughs> right. Yeah. hundred percent, dude. And yeah, you, you, you said it. Sorry for the quick break. Just a quick shout out to our sponsor, DLI Commercial, a premier commercial construction and building maintenance company offering support at every phase. Thank you for your support. Check them out at DLI Commercial for all your construction needs. Back to the show. Uh, shifting gears, uh, Biz, I, I know you, you travel a shitload. Um, you, you know, just come back from Atlanta and the Winter Classic and, and the whole bit. I mean, uh, I mean, before we get into the winter classic, like, like how do you, how do you do it, man? Cause it's like, you know, like it's, it's a grind, right? I mean, life is a grind. Traveling is a grind. I mean, the amount you put yourself out there is a, is, is a grind, right? I mean, right. I know, like I know, on a small scale, we do, you know, our version of what you do, but I, I, I can't even imagine, you know, like, and you seem to bring it always, like you're always on like, like what, 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 what is the secret, man? Yeah. I, 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 I don't know. I, I, uh, like, I mean, we just kind of had a conversation about what pushes you to do it. And I guess it, it took on a mind of its own. And then it got to a place where all these opportunities came up. And and uh, I also do have a hard time saying no. So um, that's been one of the challenges in the in the past six months is, is learning how to balance it all and like understand it and like, you know, think through it. Because like, I don't know, it's, it, it, it does get a little bit overwhelming. So... I, I mean, we had a conversation before we hopped on about sobriety. I will go periods of time when I don't drink and I do enjoy going to have drinks with the guys. Like that's kind of a sacrifice that you have to make if you want to kind of maintain what you're doing. 
um, less time for friends and family, which is another sacrifice. So it, it does come with some, some difficult sides, but, uh, you know, ultimately it's, you know, you, you, you try to test yourself and then also in the same time, find that balance to where, you know, maybe it has gone a little too excessive. So, you know, where can you, where, where can you make time for yourself in order to keep the balance going and wearing all, or, or learning also when to say, I saw a clip online the other day, someone said vitamin N or, you know, it, it, you know, saying basically being able to say no. Yeah. Like making sure yeah. you take your daily dose of being able to say no. So, and, and another thing too, is like, there's so many people that I've met along the way who have helped out and been, been positive towards me. So it's like, like you guys tonight, like I wanted to hop on. Cause I heard, you know, you guys told me it's your hundredth pod and you know, Riles, we had you on the podcast and just like learning from you about the, your experiences with, um, with mushrooms and how you've been able to transition out of playing and find a, a work life balance, you know, talking about your yoga routine. So just like, it's hard because like I, all all that success, you know, you get a lot of requests. So you're trying to keep up with like trying to give thanks to all the people that helped you along the way, whether it was this big or or or, or this big. So, yeah, no, it's um, it's it's difficult, buddy. But you just kind of keep going, and and you also only get one rip at that life. Mm -hmm. So you want to try to do as much shit as you can too. So there are plenty of fucking positives, but but. I don't think some people maybe see some of the sacrifice that goes along with it. So yep. that's yeah. just, that's a complete one or 360 answer for you as to how yeah. that works. <laughs> yeah. Well, you got definiteness of purpose, right? You wake up, you, you know, like you got, so, you got something very tangible and real and, you know, like being, being a creative, uh, you say creative genius. I mean, that's the way I describe you because I mean, you're fucking brilliant, but, uh, you know, to, to, to tap into that energy on a daily basis is, it's got to be exciting, right? I mean, it's, it gives you life force almost. Okay, so I appreciate the genius comment. I just, <laughs> I, I, I would, I'd think you're obviously way off, and I'm just kind of a bit of a donkey. I'm a Neanderthal, just like the rest of us fighters. You know, we're just knuckle draggers. But I think it was my, it's just curiosity. I just when I when I see shit, I just, I'll just keep asking questions about it. It's like Brant Myers when I told you about the LLC, like that was going to keep my options open. And like I, I asked them probably 100 questions about this LLC, asked a lot of them twice to make sure. Are you sure? Like, really, that's how it works? Like, oh, I can write off these things as a business and I can, you know, just under. So he taught me about it and he did it after he was done playing and it made me as for, as soon as I was done, as soon as I left there after getting knee surgery, the first thing I did when I got to Arizona, still having a, a, a rehabilitating my knee was I filed for my LLC, you know? Yeah. So it's just, if, if I, if anyone I would encourage, like, I just think people who end up getting to certain places, it's just their genuine curiosity. Mm, I mean, yeah. about the podcast side, about like learning about like the, the, like um like the logistics or or the the deals that we're we're cutting knowing when to delegate work and just so i appreciate the comment but it's just honest genuine curiosity yeah, yeah. well yeah i mean it's uh it, it seems to be a little more than that because it, the way you piece things together you know just like you know just an observer of you know talent uh in all its forms you know there's some that jump out to you more than others you know like there's no there's no coincidence that you, you're able to get on tnt and then, yeah you know Gretter's vouching for you and what however else you know the dynamic work there's no secret right it's like you you, you get it you'd almost expect it in fact like when, when when don cherry got squashed there i was like fuck biz is the guy like side this fucking guy up like you know it's <laughs> he's like, a funny fucker oh my god <laughs> but it's like, you know, like who can replace that guy there's like right out of the gate is like there's really no one else but you and it's just because you've 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 created this like you know larger than life type of uh you know character that you know that's you know you say like knuckle dragger you know you know all these funny terms and you know you're playing off the you know that that role that that guy but uh, there, there's more there that you have to give yourself credit for. And I don't want to sit here fucking pumping your tires, but all right, no, I, I, I am, you know, it's, I, I, I need, I need this. It's like therapy. <laughs> yeah. A couple of little, uh, micro doses, little tummy pump sticks. and you'll be fucking ready. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah there you go. Sticks, this is, yeah. this is full fledged tummy sticks, but oh, it's, it's kind of, it's kind of cool though, to talk about it once in a while. I don't do a, a, a ton of, a ton of podcasts anymore. Like I, you know, I try to hit whoever I can, but 
it's it's fun to remind yourself how you kind of got all there so i i actually appreciate you guys having me on and the kind words and stuff and, and i'm just trying to like give people a, a behind the scenes and insight that i think that anybody listening could go fucking do it i you know and i and i, and I but i in the same breath i appreciate the tire pump yeah no <laughs> doubt i know nasty's sitting over here itching to, to to pick your brain on a few things crack some stories out of you because uh he's got a bunch of shit written down here wow I was well. I was first going to ask how was the Winter Classic. Yeah, and and was that your first one that you had been to? No. So I went to the one at Notre Dame Stadium. I went to a couple Stadium Series games. Oh, they're, okay. They're, 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 they are crushing these. No, but buddy, th th this one I think it got the most viewership. Fenway Park was sold out. Boston fans are fucking nuts. They are, nuts. and it's like the fear of missing out that the reason why the bleacher seats that are like basically fucking, you couldn't see the ice. You're going right. there to get completely pickled and be with everybody getting pickled. Yeah. And, and it was cool how they set it all up though. Like the people who didn't have the best view site, they got the black keys concert for, for three songs and the, oh, they okay. crushed it. They had Sam hunt there. Uh, just the uniqueness of the stadium and the way that it captured it all and the way, how they put it all on together. I get why they do them and they, they crush yeah. it with, you know, them walking in with the baseball uniforms and the NHL has done a really, really good job with these things. And yeah, sometimes they, you know, they have some disasters like the Lake Tahoe one where guys yeah. were fucking <laughs> toe picking. Yeah. But Gretzky, Gretzky told a story of when he had one back in the day and they put the sheet to cover the ice like they do now. But for whatever reason, like that back then it was like the wrong material so they fucking rolled it back when they thought they were saving it and it was basically just a puddle oh. and they were able to reconstruct the ice in like two hours or three hours they pushed <laughs> the game back but Gretzky said that everybody was fucking toe picking all game much <laughs> like Lake Tahoe so yeah so like it's kind of just becomes these funny quirky things if they don't end up working out perfect but in some cases, they do create these magical moments. And in this yeah. case, I think I really think it did. 2-1 game, you know, yeah. d d you know, come back. Like, did you see the clip of a Gretzky shaking the guy's hand and they end up scoring the winner? Like, no. I, you guys... I missed that. So Gretzky, we, were, we had to walk back to the panel at a certain time. So we're walking back with, you know, I think, whatever, five or four, four minutes left to go in the, in the third period. And Gretzky shakes this guy's hand and literally he's like, oh my God, Gretzky touched my hand. My life is 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 turning in, in the right direction. And then boom, B score. <laughs> got score. A B <laughs> and it was just like so fucking ridiculous. And, you know, so it, uh, it, it that was a funny viral moment that it created. But uh, you go oh, back man. to the original when Crosby scored in the shootout with yeah. the fucking mm -hmm. snow all over the ice. So I think it, I think these things are fun, like one or two offs. And my experience, again, like the other three that I've been to, awesome. Keep doing them. Everybody there seems to have a fucking blast and they're getting shittered yeah. and pickled and they're having a good time. And as long as you're picking them in the right spots. And, and I think that they've done that and they're, and they're, they're, they're going to keep crushing it. So thumbs up to the NHL. I'm not just stroking them off because they signed part of my checks. Right. <laughs> I know I was lucky enough to do four. Actually, Riley and I were in the first one in Fenway uh, way back in 2010. And uh, it was against that, the Flyers with Flyers in Boston. Yeah, we lost. Oh, my overtime. God. Oh, so fuck. Biz, listen to my year this year. Didn't it was a getting the first ever fight in, in, he did. in, yeah. in history. Yeah, so you guys Thornton. had there you go. And then he was doing yeah. the rocker signal. Yeah. 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 But uh, we lost that game in overtime. And then I was fortunate enough. I did the Olympics with Team USA 2010. Sid beats us in overtime, the golden goal. Oh, for then God. we go to the finals that year and lose in overtime. Kaner scoring game six. Oh, it was a tough goodness. year, but a great year. But I just, I was fortunate enough to do four, two, two winter classics, two uh, of the, uh, what do they call them? The outdoor. Buddy, uh, the fucking, that's the a ones. triple, the triple crown of getting kicked. I know. Right there, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> fucking no nuts left. Last shot. Right oh, now. Holy man. shit. Yeah, just fucking, you know, you ever see those ones <laughs> no. where, the, where the girl yeah. comes out and the guy's on the massage table? And he's like, yeah, yeah, right, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That was it for sure. <laughs> those are ones that get sent oh. to the group chat. Yeah. Oh, can't, yeah. Can't be tweeting those ones out now, though. No, There's no, all no, right. no, no. It'd be canceled. You'd be right. canceled. You'd be done. Right. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. I, ha I had a, well, I did want to say something. You guys have a, a little bit in common. 
Riggs had one goal in NHL. Um, and it was on Carey Price. And your first goal, I believe, was Carey on Price. Carey Price. Yeah. So I was yeah. I told him you ended up getting six more than Riggs, though. Yeah. You, did, you ended yeah. up getting six more. I think you had seven. You scored right? one NHL goal. One NHL goal on hey, Carey Price. Hey, at, least, at least you fucking got one, though. It's yeah, I know, man. It's a better story to actually only have one. <laughs> yes. Yeah. 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 Two, and two more than likely like too on much. a Hall of Famer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It would have sucked to play 163 with a big goose egg. You know, I would, I would have never lived that one. I get this. Dennis Bombi every year in the minors used to go, "Hey, B, don't be scoring too much. Then they're gonna start expecting it." <laughs> yeah, right. Well, it, you know, it's funny. Just brought old bones up. So yeah. I had him a little bit in uh, Philadelphia when I was with the Phantoms. Uh, man, this guy's a beauty. But once I knew him, he would always come down and see me before the games. And I'd be like, Bones, what do you got? Do you got a couple tillies in you tonight? Ah, oh, his hands just beat to shit, oh, too. Yes. And he's like, he's like, oh, no, man, I can't be doing it tonight. I had a couple last night. Fucking puck drops. He just towed a fucking toe. Oh, fucking yeah. fighting all night. I said, well, I'd never seen a guy fight that much. Oh, man. he loved it, man. He, he loved, loved it. it. So loved it, loved that's kind of cool about our era is we got to see the like the old school, the way it was for for a long time. And yeah, for I'll, I'll be honest, fortunately for the guys now, they don't have to do it like we did at Riles because I, I remember back to back years in the AHL. And, and I wasn't a guy who was standing in there and going blow for blow. Like I had somewhat of a technique because I'm like, I don't even I shouldn't even be fucking doing this. I'm not nearly <laughs> as tough as most of these guys. But uh, but those like the Dennis Bombies and the and the guys before us. I mean, I'm sure you, in we're playing with the Phantoms, you played with some old school guys where you're like, oh my god, like talk it. Oh like yeah, he was probably oh, yeah. your assistant at some point. I'm assuming. Well, I had my dad was a trainer with the Flyers when I was growing up, so I've known Talk since he was, you know, I've known him a long time. But man, back in the day, like when I was, I'd come up to visit. You know, you had Talk, you had Dave Brown. Had, uh, I mean, it was just a yeah, handful list, of guys, yeah. man. Like ben, ben Wilson. I don't know if you, you're pretty young, Biz. You may not remember. Like that I would have, I would have been shitting my pants in pregame nap oh, if I had to God. play in that era. <laughs> oh man. Yeah, yeah. But it's a different animal. It was all different. together, it was right? A different I mean, animal. There, I mean, you talk about like supreme accountability. There was like, if you go through one, <laughs> two, you're going to three, four, five. Like you know, every team's carrying like Shit. legitimate four or five tough Shit. guys. What Biz, was the what was the average back then for those guys? Were they probably fighting oh. 30, 40 times a year in the NHL? Yeah, yeah, it was, I, de it was definitely upwards of thirty. I mean, yeah. I remember even like you know my, my era, it was always the gold standard was like hitting that thirty major mark, you know. And then, <laughs> you know, well, that was for me, anyways. I was like, got to get thirty at least. <laughs> so, so when, my first year in the NHL, I think I had nineteen or twenty. But that was post lockout, and and times were a changing already. Right. Mm -hmm. But but my time in the AHL was like, oh my god, because those players then were getting dwindled to the AHL. So you know you had the Bull Reeses and the and oh, yeah. like the ball. There there were so many f fucking heavies. I remember Jeremy Oblonsky. Uh, oh yeah. John Nasty oh, Marasty. So. Oh yeah. <laughs> like you said, the 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 back to back years with thirty. That was the standard in the NHL. Like probably about five years prior which they're like that's fucking crazy now it's probably what eight ten yeah yeah hey, ten would be a lot yeah he's i know I mean, yeah he's probably the leader, leader i don't even know like eight nine he's got so, yeah years, he's up which, there now which but is I, actually pretty high in this yeah it is and, and biz like i remember one of my last years with in, with the phantoms we went into albany and we had Chief was an assistant coach, but slash player. We had Chief, Todd Fedork, both Vandermeers, PJ Stock, and there was one other guy. And he and was my, a little nail gun. Yeah, yes, he, he was. was yeah. And Holy and my buddy, shit. my buddy Jay was the equipment guy in, in Albany, and uh, he still he works for the Islanders now. But he came down and he was like, "Nast, I've never seen a quieter room." Yeah. <laughs> and guys literally, I think are afraid to play this game. And I'm like, well, I mean, there, there, I mean, there was so much meat oh, and it was yeah, so, God. so much room. Like, I don't think any of our guys got hit that night. It was just so funny. Like, but you're it's right. Like, what do you, you go for the little guy's stock and you're still getting your lunch. <laughs> yeah. And, and he right. fought, that might've actually been one. Of, it might've been his first game with the Phantoms and he fought right off the draw. Oh, he sure. fought right off the he draw. Was gamer. He didn't give a guy, he didn't give him a chance. He just started fighting. But anyway, yeah, like you're right, man. You played with Dennis and we wrote that down, Bones. I, I love 
mess with opponents. But, the, but also, like obviously, with all that fighting came the, the, the stories and the craziness. And, you know, I, I it was kind of that era of where you still had a six-pack after a game. And that yeah. was, to yeah. me, what was cool about getting to experience that. And then and then maybe the, the probably the almost like the biggest transition in the, in the National Hockey League, where now it's just, it's like more like, it's becoming more and more like soccer. Grateful for the skill level, but also grateful that I got to see the old school side and the new yeah. school side. Yeah. What do you What do you think of the game right now? Are you like you, you love it? You know, with, with that difference, I think that it's hard some nights to get emotionally invested into regular season hockey at the beginning of the year, um, and just because you have less of those guys that. Buddy, like if, if a team wasn't playing good, you'd have like a door set go over their goalie and accidentally on purpose, like fall on top or, or like sucker one, just drag their team into the fight. And uh, right. I still think you see it though with teams that, are, like for instance, like Tampa, they they played uh, Minnesota, and I love the way Minnesota plays. They play a physical game, and even like Kaprizov will get emotionally invested and, and physically invested too. Even Zuccarello last night yeah. was, but yeah. Tampa was getting beat. But the game was entertaining throughout because they never gave up. They were still fucking competing for pucks and scrums were happening because they genuinely cared where sometimes you just, you get the sense that teams are just kind of rolling over sometimes. Right, like, right. Fuck, dude. Like, you're telling me nobody on that bench wants to fucking, like, get shit going right now and fucking, sometimes, like, that's why I love Matthew Kachuk. Yeah. Because, yeah. like. You, you're playing on his team. It's like every night you're fucking getting dragged into it by this guy. He, yeah, there's strums in- happening because he's going to the blue paint and he's fucking giving a guy a stinky mitt and saying, hey, motherfucker, I'm coming here all night. I'm, That's right. And, and I just feel like the NHL lacks a little bit about the, of that. And I think that that it's almost like it was it's like a, a race to like find all these skill guys where it's like th- those guys, types of guys aren't really being developed anymore. Like, I know if I had a kid and I'm saying, hey, buddy, like, I understand working on your skills is important, but Walt was able to tell Brady and, and Matthew, it's like, that's where the that's where the battle still won. Like, yeah, yeah, right. yeah like, play out. You come to playoff, man, and if add up the the length of the, the, the goals being scored and you fucking, all, all the red dots are going to sh- show you around the blue paint. Yeah. Like, look yeah. at fucking Pavelski. That's right. Yeah, 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 I, yeah. I, yeah. He can't move around the ice like he used to, but I'll tell you what, he'll go to the fucking areas where he knows he the does. biscuits coming, and I, right. he, and he pays a price for that. And yeah. I think less of that is being taught. Where it's like it's it's like fuck. It's also making it a little bit boring. Where it's like, ee, like yeah. oh well, I guess the machine's not working today of the dipsy doodling. So I guess we'll worry <laughs> about the next game. Like where it's like, no, go to the fucking paint. That's where we got to get one tonight because they're yeah. good in front of the net. Boom. Yeah. So. I don't know. I, I'm sure you guys feel the same. Like sometimes the emotion feels like it's been taken out of it, but like, I would like less games. Do less, less games. games. Yeah. 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 And they're going to say all oh, revenue. Okay, sure. Fuck. Yeah. All right. Make the games yeah. look maybe a little bit more special. I also said, do I said, do away with some of the TV timeouts, maybe not all of them. Cause they want to clean the ice for, for during one period. But uh, like, you could go there and there could be a whistle at the 10 minute mark. And then the, I think it's just after the 13th minute mark where it's like, bro, we just fucking stopped just the game, even for the people there. And people are like, Oh yeah, they'll never go for that. Like commercials. And it's like, add it to the intermission. Give it yeah, more right. people. Uh, apparently I was, I think I was saying that to either talk or Wayne and they were saying, Oh yeah, back in the day, there wasn't a rule. So the fucking, uh, I, I don't know if it was Chicago or, or one of these original six teams, they would say, the fucking don't start the period. Give another five minutes for people to go buy more beer. Uh, well, yeah. so con- concession. So they eventually made the rule where they set the time, right? And then teams would start getting penalized if they wouldn't hurry oh. the fuck up and get on the ice. We're not fucking waiting. Like, let's go here. So now, obviously, people are like, let's, the, the time goes, you're on the ice. Everybody's ready for puck drop literally within the, the 30, minute, 30 seconds of when they should have been mm-hmm. at the max. Um, so I just said, like, add it to the intermissions. It gives people maybe more time to talk during your intermissions to break down the game, gives more time for concessions. And it also makes the flow of the game. And I said, it takes the third and fourth liners out of it. And people are like, oh, like people aren't paying to go see the third and fourth liners. It's like, uh, they were back in the day. 
Yeah. 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 That was fucking half of why they showed up to see the fucking guys run around and fucking hit each other. Cause that's yeah. part of what drew people in, especially for the live excitement of it. And no now doubt. even the product, even on TV is like, people want to see violence yeah, like, to some degree. I'm not saying we need 30 scraps, but they want to see some bodies flying and some hits being thrown. And like, I don't know, look at UFC. UFC's done pretty fucking good. Yeah, they right. want to you see don't... people kill each other, basically. I'm not saying <laughs> go there. I'm saying right. let's get the third and fourth liners out there with a little bit more flow in the game, and let's see where the product goes with it. Well, when... get... sorry, Biz, go ahead. Well, no, last thing I'll say is like they put ads on the jerseys, and then they put ads moving on the boards. Like They've been smart enough to find other ways to create the revenue. That's yeah, true. exactly. And, and, and to your point also, like when there is a tilt, you don't see anyone sitting down. I Nobody. Mean, usually yeah. no one's in their seat when there's a fight. So, I mean, and the people yeah. that hate it are tweeting about it the most and it's getting the most clicks on whatever they're writing. So it's like, yeah, ah, exactly. like yeah. <laughs> it's, I think, I think we can, I, I think we can find a good balance here, but yeah, um, for sure. I, those are just as far as some of the, the, the rule changes. And another thing too, is like most successful teams in the league are playing their third and fourth lines at least 10 minutes. Yeah, right. exactly. So that, that, so that contradicts the argument of like, oh, nobody's paying to see the third and fourth liners. It's like, oh, well, it makes it. it may, uh, b b I don't think Boston's complaining. Fuck no. a thousand bucks for a lower wow. seat to get inside that building right now because they got four lines humming. It's yeah. crazy. It's crazy. Yeah, the elite teams do. You have to have four lines humming. And, and I do agree that you, uh, you, there needs to be some sort of balance. I, I think it went for a stretch where it was gotten so skilled and it's almost like abandoned the essence of the game to your, to, your, to a couple of your points about the meat and potatoes, the essence of the game, right? It, it is one in the corners and like being heavy and, and hard to play against. Like you can never deviate away from that too much skill is, you know, obviously great and can score some magical goals now and then. But, you know, if you're talking about actually winning and going the distance, it's like you said, the sort of fourth liners, generally the guys that score these big goals, uh, and come to playoff times, like they're leaning on their sticks, being yeah. hard. Um, uh, and I get it, you know, we're not scoring, we're not going to be fighting 30 times a year, but you can't take, in my opinion, anyways, like you can't take out that they, accountability, man. Oh like, no. Just, just, I thought you were going to say take fighting out of the game. I think that'd be, that would be the dumbest thing they, dumbest they thing ever, you ever do. do. Yeah. But also you just said the accountability. Yeah. There's a little bit of fear base in it. It's like fucking yep. fuck with my guy. Like keep your fucking watch your neck. And yeah. I don't know, man, that's sport. That's just, that's sport. Those are people who might not understand the other side. And I mean, yeah, I don't know. You got to keep the integrity. hundred uh, percent. You know, you have these people like want to bubble wrap the world, right? It's like, you know, you throw out all these stats around, you know, brain injuries and all that stuff. And trust me, I'm a huge supporter of protecting the brain and, and, and yeah. mental health, all that stuff. But I think there's a fine line, um, you know, when you talk about the trade-off and there's, you know, a, a few different things you would never be able to quantify when it comes to, the accountability where they're self-policing yes two guys taking blows to the head probably not good for brain health we i think we could all agree on that but some of the the plays that happen in today's day and age like would never have happened like you know there's a a little bit of less of a respect to how the game is played in my opinion anyways where it could have been probably uh cleaned up how ha had two guys just you know gone to war and, and sucked up a couple of uh, these punches and then you know maybe you know maybe not drinking beer anymore but smoking smoking uh, some herb and or crushing some mushrooms to help you know <laughs> fix the you, brain you know where the happy median was when it, it stopped where guys would just go line up and do it yes as long as if there's a purpose to it i'm okay with it mm -hmm. it was it was i was thankful that that you know because like, there's some some tragic deaths in the nhl as a result of, of of these types of situations and guys doing that for a living right so when that ended it was like kind of like you know what i i'm okay being somebody who did that and survived and got to live off of it and play in the nhl because of it i'm okay that that's no longer the case where we we seem to have at least came to a, a reasonable agreement but i i do believe that be, there was a time where it really dwindled. I believe we're getting back to a happy median. Yeah, I right. think it's I swaying back in the other direction, and people are seeing value in having Ryan Reeves on your team, in mm -hmm. having a very big, strong lineup like the Minnesota Wild. Like, look at their right. team. They got Felino. They got Greenway. Those are guys who, I mean, who did fucking uh, Felino have a good? Oh, it was with Reeves. Like he fought yeah. Reeves yeah. in Madison Square Garden last That's year. Right. And it was like. Whew, everybody was talking about it. There was the iconic photo and there was a purpose behind it where it's like, I'm not going to get fucking bullied around. I'm a big enough guy to take this fucking guy on. 
Like that right. shit, people, those are storylines and, and big aspects of our game that that in in the doldrums of the season can can carry weight and help the game survive. Yeah, absolutely. Biz, when you were um <clears throat> when you were playing and and you know you you took that role on like Riley did, um did you have did you have trouble like having your pregame nap? Did you, you know, did were you constantly thinking about it or were you just like I'll worry about it when I get to the rink because uh, one of our good buddies, Craig Barubi, obviously, you know, chief, um, he, he joked about back in his time when he was doing it. He said that one day Keenan calls him over and says, hey, I'm going to I'm going to not I'm not going to play Brownie tonight. They're in Detroit. He goes, what? He goes, what are you fucking talking about? He's, he got coaster fucking uh, Chase. Yeah. yeah. Hey, well, all those guys in um, body, dude. And he's like try taking a nap going in there to play you know i gotta fight probert he says i fight probert i do do well and i'm like whoo get to the box and coaster is knocking on the glass i'm I'm next next. imagine that i mean i'm a pips i would you know i'm oh four and one biz by the way if you don't know (laughs) (laughs) they were never on the ice though (laughs) oh okay i was gonna say fuck you getting some bar scraps no, no, yeah, no. Oh, the but, bench but, it's, whether you, just, it's whether you show up. At least those ones you don't got to worry about the pregame app because you don't know they're happening. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, right. No, but uh, I just wondered how how you uh, went about like dealing with that, buddy. So I think about those old school, more old school guys and what they had to deal with, and and that's another reason why the lining up and doing it because you knew that you were going to do it. So I knew about the torment before. So yeah, I had a hard time sleeping pregame. But I had to sleep because if I wasn't, I would be up just thinking about who I got to go, right? Yeah, so right. the nap, as much, yeah, it, it was it was beneficial and also yeah, like it was just you know, at least you felt rested going into it. Um, I think that that was also, I think that you talk. Remember we talked about like the fear base. I mm-hmm. think that that fight or flight having to get to yourself to that place is has been also beneficial in my post career doing what I do now. Whereas maybe it wouldn't have been if I ha- hadn't had to been through those uh, through, through those situations, just from like of like a, a like a nerve standpoint to getting your place to a place where you got to like be on and perform, I guess. But <laughs> Riles, you started doing yoga and you do it all the time. I would imagine that that fight or flight has to be detrimental to your health at a certain point, right? Because it's just these like it's it's not balanced it's fucked up that what you had to do to get yourself to a place mentally and to know that you had to go out there and do it. Yeah. The way I describe it is like a chronic state of anxiety, you know, like you're in the middle of fight, you're in the middle of fight or flight, right? Because you're, 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 you know, it's probably going to happen. You're not sure when, but you can't, you can't just disappear, you know? So you're kind of like always waiting for it to happen. So yeah, man, it's, uh, it it taxes on your, your, your emotional system and your, in your nervous system, man. It's just like, just wears, man. That was the biggest thing. That's why I teed it up for you because you do, you're, you're do a better job of describing how it all works <laughs> because you put the work in to understand what it's done to you and you know that, that's why like i you know I've, we've had some great conversations and you've you've put a lot of work into to understand all that and to get to a well-balanced place buddy and that's i mean that's kudos to you that's that's just as admirable as anything we're talking about on this podcast right and how long did it take you to understand that? And, and like, what other works did you have to do in order to kind of maybe like be at peace with the fact that you were having to do that? Like, do you think it caused you tons of trauma that you had to get over? Yeah, there, there, there was, there was a lot of, a lot of stuff that I had to unpack there. Um, you know, there was some substance abuse stuff that again, I'm not sure if it was necessarily the role itself, you know, because I, you know, I'd partied in junior before I even took on the role. You know, what I mean, it was just part of it's just part of the game. It's just part of the culture, yeah. right? Um, you know, there was concussion related stuff, like some, you know, some 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 funky head stuff going on, and then there's this like this, you know, this identity of like, you know, who am I? You know, like what am I doing? And if this is my childhood dream, like it's not overly fulfilling for at least for like, for me. It was just like because it was again, I was like the thirteenth forward. You know, you know, I was just in that position of like I I could not say no. There was no spot picking. I, I had to pick the number one heavy, and there's no, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't pluck number two or three. You know what I mean? It would be like dodging number one. So there's just all this, like, you know, this, uh, the psychological shit that wears on you. So, um, you know, there's a few things there, but you know, all jumbled up together. You know, and trying to make sense of y- your your life and your career path, and uh, and, and then also making a hard decision. Like I, I, I was 28 years old, 2010, and when I retired, and I had another one-way contract with the Flyers that I 
turn you know the forfeited to 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 retire to to recapture my mental health right it was there was some no strategy shit, eh? so yeah, you, yeah. you you retired to basically just say because because at that point where had you were you just exhausted from it all yeah i was i was exhausted and and that year what well, was the year we lost the, the blackhawks in the finals uh john stevens had got fired you know early in the season peter laviolette comes in he won a Stanley Cup in Carolina without a tough guy. He really had no use for me. And and you know, that being said, I'll be honest. Like I, you know, I was fat. I was I was you know I wasn't like I wasn't an elite athlete. I wasn't as good as I should have been. So you know, naturally a coach comes in and you know doesn't play me. So I actually worked my bag off to lean up in a little bit to be accountable. I only played 17 games that year. Um, uh, but you know, going in you know into the off season, I was fucking. I was just mentally just exhausted because I had another year in my contract, like I said, but I was probably going to get sent down to the minors. And, um, you know, it's interesting how things work out sometimes. And you put, you know, you put out, you know, how you're feeling to the ether, to the universe, whatever you want to call it. Um, I was honest with Paul Homer at the end of the year saying like, fuck, man, like this was a tough, tough year for me, you know, and whatever else and kind of laying out my feelings. And then, uh, you know, two weeks after the season, I had a couple of surgeries, go back home is when he called me up, there was an opportunity to get into coaching with the Flyers minor league team, the Phantoms at the time. And it was almost like immediately, like, this is my, this is it. This is like an exit strategy for me to like stay in the game, but also to, to embark on this quest. It was just like, it was necessary. It was like immediately in that moment, like, you know, played hockey my whole life, you know, easy to forfeit that last year of my, you know, my, my playing. Cause it was like, I just needed to do this for myself. It was tough but easy easy decision almost right because it was like that was more important than this this egocentric thing that i was chasing That's huge that he reached out and, and like that olive branch to be able to be a coach and like still stay around the game and stuff did you enjoy it i i really did yeah i mean i i, I loved i loved it you know and i, and I love communicating with the players on a different level like that's where i think i really got into kind of the work i'm doing now it's like it's it's meaningful work where i you know, as assistant coach, you're like a buffer zone, right? I mean, you're just like, you're just the ear, like between the coaches, you know, the head coach and the player. Um, so you just like you're having like meaningful conversations around like, you know, what, what's driving you? Like, you know, why is your performance, you know, inconsistent? And a lot of the stuff that they would answer, I could, you know, make sense of in my, you know, my own performance when I was playing. It's like, oh, geez, I was hung over half the time. Oh, you know, <laughs> how can you be consistent when you're living like this? You know what I mean? So you're, you're, you're playing yeah. kind of like, it's you funny know. how that changes yeah, when, you, yeah, when, you, when, you, when these yeah, guys yeah, become right. a, a coach, right? Yeah. So yeah, it was, it was I nasty. It. Nasty. Originally, the question was about like what it what it did to you, and it kind of branched off into all this. But it's this is awesome. This is such a good conversation. So I appreciate your guys' questions and and where it's all going. It's and like you, you said, one thing that stuck out is I don't know if it was just like the culture and the job at hand and, and how I felt about myself. And in a sense, like I didn't really have a choice. I was the 13th guy. I was going to get healthy scratch when I was in, I had to try to fight and do what I could with the three minutes I was getting. I definitely think that I, uh, I partied uh, years off of my NHL career oh, where, yes. So, so that's one thing in the moment and being young that I didn't understand. Probably another reason as to why I'm like, you owe it to yourself on the back half to, to, to try to like not operate like that and be more consistent and keep yourself more accountable in that regard. And you, and we kind of learn from that side of it. You're like, like I said, you doing all the yoga and, 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 and the more of the balance. Like I very, like I, I really admire that side of you. No, thanks. I mean, it was, it was necessary, but it's been a complete shift of perspective, right? I mean, again, you, you, it's, you, you were kind of programmed, right? I mean, from birth almost, right? I mean, from parents and society and then like culture of hockey, there's like these, these kind of like mini programs in it all until you kind of step outside of that world and, and start seeking something that's like way beyond that like you know there's an ancient philosophy behind it right around <laughs> spine health and you know and meditation and breath right i mean prana life force all this stuff it's like you have a completely different perspective around performance so i was like holy shit that i hit the bullseye in the wrong target like i was a hard worker but that's about it like i had a good <laughs> attitude like i did i hit the you know you i just killed completely coffee. missed the rest you set of the records in black coffee before a game oh yeah i'm out of coffee uh, two <laughs> feds I ate and drank before the, games. The <laughs> like, oh yeah <laughs> i'm surprised my heart actually still going <laughs> busy we play ju we ju we play uh men's league together and once in a while Riggs gets a little wound up he's had a couple guys come at him and i see the the, the eyes start to go a little bit 
have to fucking calm him oh, down. Oh yeah, fuck. That's, <laughs> I, I don't even bother with the men's league. And sometimes a guy, a couple guys, take it a little too serious. Oh, like, oh hey, yeah. buddy. Hey, buddy. <laughs> yeah. we're, we got to go to work tomorrow. Let's just fucking exactly. You know, let's, let's just get our exercise. And <laughs> hey, buddy, if uh, if you do want to, if you do want to tango, though, I got in a scrap at a men uh, a money tournament one year when I was uh, playing. My, me and my buddy Jamie Tardiff, we joined up with, uh, uh, I got a money tournament in London with a bunch of guys we knew from Saginaw. And there was this one game, one guy was being a hero to one of the guys who wanted nothing to do with it. Nicest guy on the team, like wouldn't hurt a fly. And he kept going at him. So I lined up next to him. I said, hey, if you fucking want one, I'll give you one. I fucking broke the guy's nose. <laughs> no shit. I don't think, I was in the American Hockey League at the time. So nobody, you know, I don't, Twitter wasn't a thing. Like, so he's yeah. probably like, this guy's just some fucking nobody too. So, <laughs> but it was, so I was, that was, a, that was when I was fucking fighting 30 times a year. Like, yeah, I, yeah. Knew, I, knew, I, I had been trained on where to grab and, and yeah. exactly where I was going where, yeah, maybe it ain't working against Bull Reese most nights or fucking, <laughs> yeah, John Morassi's probably pumping my fucking eyes shut, but there's some scrub <laughs> off the street who doesn't even know his, know his edges a hundred percent. I'm going to fucking right. dummy him. Right. So oh, that, fighting on skates is like, it's not, it's no joke. Some of these guys have no clue. Oh, I know, I know. Balance is a little bit different on the blades, right? It doesn't <laughs> yeah. matter how, how yeah. tough you are on the uh, on the street, but it's yeah, yeah. I, I try and stay away from that. Now I'm, I'm a skill guy now, Biz. You know, he is, I'm he a, is. A skill oh, guy. isn't it plays, awesome? Flowing out go, there, buddy. Yep. You go back to exactly why you fell in love with the game. We exactly, talked about all this right. craziness. It's like it, it it brings me back the other way, which is probably a nice relief for you. Hundred percent, yeah. It's you know, it's a creative game, and you realize, like you know, when you're growing up, you, you're attracted to it for a reason. I th looking back on it, it, was like it's the creative aspect of it. It's like you know, there's there's free flow, there's you know, there's there, there's creativity, there's read and react, you know, and, and that's what you're attracted to, the pond hockey version of it. And now I get to flow a little bit with some micros, get out there, yeah, there feel good, flow. you know, not be too bothered with anything, and uh, <laughs> have some fun with it, you know. It's, well, that's what it's all about. It's like skiing too. It's just like it's completely take. You have to be in the moment, right? Yeah, present. And that's uh, that's an important thing in life. Yeah, that is the essence of it all, right? Being present. That's the oh. to the spine of yoga and spine of you know all mindfulness and, and all spiritual leaders, right? It's that there's no other time that exists except for the present moment. Fucking that's where flow a. happens, preach. right? Preach, yeah. preach, <laughs> create hey, a flow. You know, we got to ask him. Uh, we winning your Calder Cup there in match. Um, you play with Jordan Wheel. I think he was the MVP of that, right? The Wheel deal. Yep. Oh yeah. Did you ever get a look at the pregame ritual of Jordan? He, Wheel? He, yeah, he, he was a big <laughs> me memorization kind of guy. I love that. I love that shit. I, I, so he was basically the AHL version of like Paul Korea. Cause you always yeah. used to hear these stories about Paul Korea and what his pregame routine was. And he'd lay down the towel and he'd go through his like yoga to be stretching for 45 minutes before he put his gear on. And, you know, I respect guys who have a, a strict routine and, and one that helps them elevate their game. He was um, MVP of the Caller Cup run that year. Yeah, yeah. And he was such a special crafty player. He was undersized, but just, just a treat to watch and a great teammate. And yes, was he quirky? He <laughs> used to fucking, what, what other shit? I think that he had like the worst, oldest gets you'd ever see in your life. And it's like, why are you even wearing this? It's like lace at this point. And lace. But, you know, or like, you know, these stockings yeah. that these girls wear in their yeah. fucking TikTok videos or whatever. Yeah. But it was, it was just like, I, he was just such a quirky guy, but such a fucking crafty player. I know you guys had him there for a little bit. He was in, yeah. in Montreal. And I just think that maybe, maybe if he was coming in now, hmm. he might have yeah. had a better opportunity at a younger age. I don't know how he's holding up, but it is hard to survive still, though, when you're extremely undersized. That's why I right. think so many people are interested to see what happens with Connor Bedard. Hmm. Right. Mind you, Crosby's 5'11. 511. 5'11 is different than 5'9. But you know, I, I'm hoping the best. And I think that the rules are going towards the way where players like that can survive but uh it's it's hard though because it's such there's so many these fucking freak athletes that can skate and they're big and they can move just as quick as a little guy so you if you're going to be small you have to outthink them you have to just outsmart them you have to outskill them you have to outshoot them you have to have a lot in your bag and you have to be able to figure it out where look at how crosby gets it done too 
Like yeah. he gets it done below the goal line and he takes yeah. punishment. Yeah, there, does, there is going to be punishment. Will he be able to adapt to that? So for Wheel, it just sucks he didn't come in at a better time. We had that um, O'Neal too. Oh but, right, okay. Uh, yeah, I forget his I forget his first name. Who was another undersized guy who won? Who, he was on our team. He won, I believe, the scoring title and the league MVP that year. Oh, he wow. went over to the KHL and Yoker it, and he's having a tremendous amount of success. So a lot of the times, those types of guys have to go over to the KHL or Europe to really be appreciated at that level. Yeah, and he, I think that the that only fuck. How am I forgetting his first name? Fucking Jesus Christ, he's gonna kill me. <laughs> Too much I'm travel. Gonna look on I'm gonna look at yeah, exactly. Yeah, right. Blame it on that. Yeah, I know you're so, right. And you know, for 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 Wheelie too, like you know, when you're a skill guy like that, and you're not like you're not a draft pick, and you're not slotted in these positions where they're gonna give you like 10, 12 chances, like. You, you you try to play your in your game and make your moves and if they don't they don't work and you don't you don't produce like you're right away like you're, you're chopped like you know it's like there's he no was, there's he was no, easy to set yeah like. exactly he's easy guy to sit you know so you just know there's no way for those guys to flourish and and i think like John, johnny gurdjieff would be a perfect example of a guy that's like elusive that just doesn't you just don't get hit like yeah, he's he just like try and hit him he is know? so like, fun to watch man yeah. i saw a game live in columbus this year and five shifts a game you're just like oh my god this guy is just something else yeah he, but he could have been here like, yeah i know but like you said though <laughs> guys is if you if you're drafted first round and you're that size you might get the opportunities more so than you would if you right. if you weren't and that's why for o'neill it, it was a shame that maybe he didn't get more of an opportunity because if he maybe if he would have he would have popped off maybe he would have been that martin st louis or maybe he yeah. would have been that you know that other undersized guy like look at look at uh cole caulfield like, yeah right he, he he had a tough tough i know he he was drafted first round he had a tough start to the year with the charm and then saint luke saint louis came in and all of a sudden he's now he's flourishing right so there is a possibility if you are given somebody who who, who lets you be you and, and allow you to be creative yeah, yeah. Yeah, you got to have that coach, and that was actually something we wanted to touch on. Just, just coaches, uh, you know, uh, that you you might have had that have helped you. Anything you mentioned one earlier, um, but you know, coaches that have helped you grow um, as a player, and just coaches that you see now, like you know, being a, a newer age coach and like the the old school coaches phasing out. Perspective on that. I mean. I uh, I had such good coaches. I have no complaints about even in uh, minor hockey in Welland, Ontario. We had such a good system there where you were being handed off to another reputable guy who who um, everybody seemed to have respect for, and there wasn't any cattiness to it. So as far as the political aspect of minor hockey and maybe where it's gotten, I really didn't have to deal with that. So I'm very grateful for all that early on. And then even as it came up through the ranks, like I had – solid OHL coaches who were always fair and never like belittled me and always, you know, always believed in me. I had Mike Stuthers. That was my first real hard coach who taught me accountability from a super ag aggressive standpoint, but I loved it. I, you know, he, he would, you know, he, he would walk that fine line in the locker room and he's also adapted over time. He's still working with the, the Anaheim ducks. Um, so, even when I got to pro, everybody I had at the pro level uh, was was amazing, and and everybody. I never had a guy who made me not want to go to the rink. Really, some oh, guys. Cool. Michael yeah. Terrian was very intimidating. <laughs> We're gonna ask you about but, him, yeah, French Mike. But French Mike, <laughs> yeah, definitely an interesting guy. Where don't know if he was self aware enough to understand that his approach was like a little bit like bro you're, you're blowing smoke in the bus driver's face you're like you ask them to open, just maybe have them pull the bus over and go have a fucking <laughs> cigarette like yeah. nobody's gonna say shit like you know maybe not blow it through the guy uh also the, <laughs> like the way the way that he spoke to players like even at the nhl level when he got there it's like uh you're not doing yourself any favors as far as giving yourself wow. a shelf life, shelf life here either buddy right but but may, but then also like as you grow up you understand like maybe that's the way that he learned the way that coaches treated him and that's just how his like how he's it's like the fight or flight state we only yeah. know one way right if he only knows one way and that's what he thinks he's had to do to be successful it's like okay 
but there, at a certain point, there has to be some adaption because we've figured out that that's really not how you, you're supposed to communicate. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Right. Exactly. It's just like, it, and it's if you point. haven't been able to adapt, it's like, well, you're not, you're just simply not doing yourself any favors. Like, yeah, Mike Babcock is a great coach in, in a lot of as- aspects, but it's also the thing that fucking burnt them. Yeah. Right? yeah. And he's a fucking brilliant, apparently a brilliant coach. Like some people may say otherwise, cause they're like, well, that's not how you get the best out of your players. Most people would look at Coop, John yeah. Cooper, yeah. as yeah. being successful and being able to manipulate his group with, yeah, knowing when the right time to put the right push the right buttons, but also knowing that like they are the one on the ice fucking putting the puck in the net. You trying to make their job as easy as possible, right? So, but once again, like having had a coach like that, him being like that also taught me that that's not what I would want to be if I was a head coach, right? And we, we just interviewed, um, Jim Montgomery. Hmm. Yep. I didn't get a chance to interview him, but fuck it. It sucked. Cause now he's the coach of the Boston Bruins went for, through a very difficult time in Dallas. Uh, yeah. but yet started as a player coach. Uh, I believe he, um, talked to Joel Quinville, who was also a player coach before he became a coach, whether it was assistant or head coach. So th- what you can learn by just like talking to people or experiencing things and understanding whether, you know, you'd want to do that approach or not is, is I think is extremely valuable. So it, it always teaches you a lesson, not only about yourself, but about maybe how you want to hold, handle yourself moving forward. So he was, de- I mean, yeah, I don't really think I have any crazy experiences or stories with, with Terry and specifically, um, other than like, sometimes I felt bad for the guys who were getting ripped on video <laughs> but, and, and like, Oh, how, how maybe they would feel shitty and they, maybe they were going home, sucking their thumb, not feeling so good about themselves. I just think that, that I never really put myself in a situation where I wasn't going balls to the wall every game, just based out of fear of being that person. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no doubt. And it's, it's evolved significantly, right? I mean, it's like the Mike Keenan's of the world. It's yeah. like that old, like yeah. fear-based teaching, right? It was like, if, if you don't perform, oh, I'm gonna, I'm, first of all, I'm going to make I'm make an ass of you in front of your teammates. Then I'm going to send you down to, to the minors, you know, like that fear-based. My, yeah, my dad worked under Keenan. And uh, it was funny because I was just getting to that age where like, you know, like, I could stay in the room. The guys are talking and they just did not like him and the shit that was being said and and then i would hear like what he was doing to guys and what he and i was like wow like my high school coach doesn't do that yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah right, right. but nasty crazy. you said it extremely unhealthy behavior and there's probably guys like livelihoods that he ruined and oh sure some of the stories are like ah ha ha you know that's funny and they're iconic stories but on the other side it's like uh that's that sounds like abuse of power Right. Yes, exactly. What it is. It's exactly what it is. It's abuse, really, when it comes down to. But I guess you could justify in the name of sport and winning, right? It's like this weird dynamic, this dichotomy to it all. But you mentioned Coop. Like, you know, I feel like these types of guys and, and coaches is like the, the the new age coaching, right? It's like you have to be transparent. You have to be a good communicator. Like in the long gone are the days where it's like you don't communicate with your players, right? It's like if you don't hear from the coach, it was like good news, right? Because if you're going to hear from them, you're either not playing or you're going to go sit down <laughs> yeah. to the minors, right? I know if I was a head coach, buddy, I'd be in the hallway being like, like how, how you doing? How, how's the group feeling? Yeah. Okay, yeah. you guys are tired. All right. Well, listen, how about we push through today and I give you guys tomorrow off and then you and then you and then you repay me by fucking playing your nuts off the next night. 100%. Yeah, that's exactly not shut the fuck up, get on the ice, quit fucking complaining. It's like, yeah. And then if, if they're complaining a little too much, you're like, you motherfucker, shut the fuck up. You know, <laughs> yeah, like, right. I would, I, I would say that like, oh, I fucking gave you two days off the last couple of weeks. You guys got to see your families and then that's the fucking effort you give me. Shut the fuck up, put your gear on. We're going an hour and a half today and I'm going to fucking skate your nuts off. And then, <laughs> and, then, and then I'll back off and I'll let you guys get your rest before the next. That's how I would handle shit. Yeah, you know? yeah, hundred percent. Players just want to be heard, right? And yeah, Chiefs they want another to be good heard. example. They want to be heard. If if you feel listened to as a human, or even outside of the hockey, that that's what people want, right? You feel heard, then at least you can, you know, you can sit back and you know you feel like you you said your piece. Chiefs another good example of like that hybrid of the old school. I mean, he had the Keenans of the world. He had yeah. that old school, complete old school mentality, and he's able to bring that and and create some sort of hybrid model where Chiefs 
I, I, awesome communicator. You know what I mean? Is he, he's he's open. He's honest. Uh, yeah, he's he, he'll honest. say exactly what he needs, but without like making you feel like a bag of shit, right? They had those cameras in the locker room for some of his speeches along their run, and you could just. That's why I was saying, like in the same breath, he'll come in after the game and say, "You guys worked your nuts off tonight. You are you earn every fucking inch. You guys deserve that. I'm so proud of you." But yet, after the first period of the next game, if they're not doing the things that they should be in order to be successful, he's like, "What the fuck are we doing here?" Yeah, I yeah. crazy last game for that for doing it a certain way, and you're going to go away from that and try to fucking skill it up. Fuck off. Yeah. Get back to winning, and, and and that's how you should be able to communicate with your team, and they should have that mutual respect for you, where they you know they know you're not belittling them. They're just be, he, he's being realistic about his expectations as to what he needs from you to be for the team to be successful. Yeah, that's it. Uh, what are your thoughts on you know Torts is kind of in that category of like you know probably on the tail end of that old school. Uh, do you do you see his style? The way he communicates, working in Philly, I know I, maybe the team itself is not quite to where it needs to be for him to like thrive in that environment. But do you do you think that method will will, will work in the next two years? Yeah, I, I just you know I think that he's great for the game. I think that he he definitely has evolved a little bit. I don't know if I agree with some of the way that he handles things and and almost like uses the media to do it. Yes, um, I agree. I I just. You know, I think that, that I mean that's good for. I, I'm in media. I, every time something happens, I say "fucking great," gave me something to talk about. But <laughs> if you're trying to get a, a a rapport with your players, I think that sometimes he goes about things the wrong way. Like, uh, but in some ways, it does get the best out of some players that have played for him. For instance, like Nick Felino was the captain in Columbus when he got there. Yeah. And he came on our podcast and he said that when Torts got there, he called him in. It was like, I don't think you're captain material. So that's not how I would have approached it. But Felino's experience was I went, brought my fucking work, my lunch pail every day. And he almost like he wanted to earn that trust. And he did by yeah. doing so that the way that Torts wanted it to be done, where the way that he handled the situation with Hazy this year. Yeah. I also sometimes wonder if it's like 3D chess where they're like, hey, we need to take him out of the lineup because he, he's kind of the, the morale of the team. And, you know, they're, we're not going to win with him out of the lineup and we need to keep losing more games because we want Bedard. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. Maybe, maybe yeah, I'm overthinking it. it. Maybe I'm overthinking it too, right? Yeah. And, and, but it. no, definitely, definitely don't, don't, I, I just, I was confused about the hire. I think it's a a distraction to the fan base as to how bad it might really be. Where yep, it's like, yeah. oh, we're trying to win now. It's like, well, you shouldn't be, because it's like, wow. you, 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 I don't know if you've you've managed your assets properly, and I don't think you've maybe signed the right guys, and I don't think that, that you know, blah blah. The, the the reasons go on and so forth. With the most of you have probably seen about the organization. Right. So, <clears throat> I, uh, I just. Uh, I think that he's, he, he, I, I still, I'm surprised he hasn't figured it out more would be my response to that. Yeah. And, and I don't, I don't agree with some of his methods and he might not give a fuck though. He might be hoping he gets fucking canned because he can go enjoy retirement making four sheets a year. Right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. AV's still know. getting paid. Yeah. AV's yeah. Right. Still, yeah. He's going to get paid. Five yeah. million he's making a year. Five. Yeah. yeah. Five. I think he, five what's he got one more year of that? One more year or two? No, two, one two, more, one, one more, more, more after yeah. this. Yeah, he's got one yeah, more. Yeah, so it's just. Thanks but for then coming. Again, like, I, but, but then again, I've never been a head coach in the National Hockey League. Who the fuck am right. I to say that that's all I, all I'm looking at it is from the player perspective. And maybe if, so I think after the, the day after he sat him, he never called him in to have a conversation with Hazy, I believe. Cause it, and it was even talked about in the media, like, no, I never found out why I, I was, I was, uh, you know, scratched for, or not scratched, um, sat for the remaining period. I would call a guy in and say, you know, I am fucking sitting you and, and like embarrassing you and not, not, not even embarrassing you. I'm not giving you fucking ice time. If this is the effort I would have clips ready. I don't think this is right. I don't think that's right. I don't think this is right. I don't think this is right. And I think you're letting down your teammates. I think you're showing them a bad example of how to play hockey and be successful at it. If there were, in fact, examples, and if there were, and that's that would be my approach to doing it, not going silent treatment, not doing it in the media, 
I'd say, yeah, I, I sat him because I wasn't seeing things that I thought were appropriate to send an example. And I don't think that he was earning his ice time and he's going to be back in the lineup next game. And I hope that he brings a better effort and I've had a talk right. with him. Yeah. Boom. Yeah. Totally. We, we were kind of, we talked about that a little bit, like, okay, you sat him the whole third period, but did you need to scratch him? Like after you kind of sent a message, right. But like you said, I don't know if he had a meeting or not, if he didn't, but then you scratch him the next game. I, I don't, I don't think that went over yeah, real well. Yeah. A conversation, a conversation before doing it by saying, listen, I don't want to embarrass you as a leader on this team. Right. But other people would argue like, oh, you're being soft. He's trying to set an example to the young guys. It's like, well, if you're sending the example to the young guys that you've lost your, one of your core group guys trust, well, then That's I don't know good. how they're going to feel about approaching you and, and communicating with you in order to right the ship. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. And this is like going back to the start of this specific conversation. It's it's all about communication. Like you can do all these things we're talking about. You can you can teach players hard lessons, right? You can teach teams hard lessons, but you don't got to be a dick. You don't got to like you know. You don't got to you, you know come across the, that way. In my opinion. I I completely agree. I think the last example of it um, for a coach was probably Sutter in L.A. And by the second cup, and this is, I've, t I've talked to guys on that Kings team, they hated his guts the second cup. But Lombardi wouldn't fire him because he had already proven that his method with the what they had built and the personnel that they had, he could d direct them his style of hockey and how and how to win another one. And they did. But from what I hear is, is that during the second one, they were having mutinies where they were sending him off the ice and having powwows amongst the group saying, fuck him. We're doing it for the guys here oh, inside wow. this circle, not wow. that guy. But in the same breath, hey, I guess he pushed the right buttons, right? Yeah, yeah. exactly. He right? Somehow yeah. pushed the right buttons. But I, the mental strength on that group of guys and where they'd come from, like he had Rob Scuderi who was there, mm -hmm. at yeah. least for the first one, right? I think he yeah. might have been there also for the second one. But he – Greener, Greener was a big yep. voice in that locker room who had already seen and he'd been through it all. He, he Sutter didn't intimidate him, right? Yeah, he, right. He he'd fucking shake his head and get the fuck out of the locker room and I'll talk to the guys and we'll figure this out, like all of them. And yep. so that was probably the last example where you look at all these guys: Bednar, players' coach; Coop, mm -hmm. players' coach. Yep. As as structured as Trotz is, he was a player coach. He's got a big heart. Mm -hmm. Um. Yep. Who who are some other teams in in the last little bit? Like Quinville was a strict guy, but he was a fucking guys guy, and he was for the mm -hmm. boys. Like fuck, he would have some chuckles with the guys, and he was a. I think he was extremely fair, and guys loved playing for him. Um, who were the other two, uh, or who are the other cups in the midst there? I, I would say even Lavi. I know he's got the one with Wash there. I thought you know as much as Lavi didn't play me, I actually appreciated Lavi. Yeah, yeah, Carolina, Carolina, and then uh, in, yeah. Well, as he wasn't a wash when he won, but no, yeah, no, but, that yeah, was trots, nonetheless, but I, he yeah, trots, trots, yeah. for a while. Yeah. But yeah, but I thought like, you know, Lavi was, you know, a good communicator as, as much as you don't want to hear some stuff. At least like I knew where <laughs> yeah. I stood with him. You know, it wasn't like I was like left in the dark. You know, I played 17 games, but like at least you warmed up me. every single warmed game. Up every though. single game. He talked to me. I was like me day. too. I would be, I would get to be in the locker room with the guys and, and warm up. And I was the DJ. I used to fucking just be around for morale, much like you yeah. were. We yep. live very, very similar paths. <laughs> yeah, we we definitely did. Yeah. I it the was necessary, that, yeah. though. It was. That, I mean, you guys. It, that's guys wanted you. You guys in the room. That's the thing. You know, like obviously you want to play more, but it was important for guys like you to to yeah. be there. But then I appreciate like Lavi actually recognizing that. Yeah, like, right. He did around because yeah. I actually had been on waivers. Well, at least once that year. You know, he could have easily sent me down, but like you know, like at least he. You know, he showed that he recognized yeah, some glue in there. You know, uh, which Fucking I think right. is uh, you know some some bit of a, a skill and and coaching. So also obviously. nice when you end up in the in the spot that you feel comfortable in. Obviously, you and Philly, you guys just meshed well, like fan base wise, teammate wise, great group of guys. I was fortunate when I landed in Arizona, and and, yeah. and every I was fortunate every organization I landed in where it, it worked. Other than that AHL year when I went to the Coyotes farm team. That was the only time I didn't feel like I, I was really welcomed in a locker room. It might have had to do with maybe my attitude going in. Who knows? Something was off. And I don't think it was bad. I just don't think I gelled with some of the guys that were there. But it led me to go to uh, Manchester. So that's always important mm -hmm. too, right? 
and, yeah. and, and, and I'm fortunate where I had Shane Doan, Keith Yandel, mm. Adriana Coyne, uh, Derek Morris, like Ray Whitney. We had so many fucking awesome guys where that was, uh, that was also important into embracing like who we were as a role. Right. Like, yeah. You know, you, you said how many times you got healthy scratch, but yet they still wanted you in the locker room. Like that feels pretty fucking cool. Like that could yeah. be a dark time if you're not warming up and not feeling like a part of the group, yeah, especially right. on the way out. Right. On yeah. the la- in the last year. Yeah. Yeah. So true. Yeah. I'm yeah, grateful for all those, you know, those experiences, but yeah, again, having a coach that, you know, at, at least found a role for, you know what I mean? Like fucking right. Kept you in the mix to keep, you know, like, yeah, you right. He recognized that enough that, that, uh, you know, it's at important. least from my perspective, it's important. Yeah. yeah. yeah Make exactly. people feel like they're people. Well, that's yeah. it. Right. That's how you empower them. Right. If you want, if you want your players to perform the best they can perform, you have to let, you have to empower them. Right. They can't be so rigid and, and worry about this and that like you got to let them be and create their own space right i mean uh, and obviously have some structure around like limitations and boundaries of like what you can and can't do but the the, the coaches that i found like the strictest with like that type of stuff making mistakes or like you know generally the guy they, they don't maximize their players talent at least in my opinion from what i've seen yeah but. oh for sure yeah all right, Biz. Uh, we've kept you on for an hour and a half. Dude, it's been oh, epic. It's been, it's been such a fun chat, man. I ha- I gotta say real quick. For like, I was I was watching you guys the other day, and yeah, had Colsey on. Oh, I yeah. was crying when you talked about. You can't land the plane, Sty- dude. His style. He's worse than me as far as uh, uh, the branching out. He goes uh, R.L. Stein goosebumps. Choose your own ending. He's like, I guess, <laughs> I guess I can be bad too, but. He's, he has a hard time landing the plane. He, but he's a fucking beauty. He was so good during that sandbagger too. Oh, oh my god. Oh man. Yeah, he's a funny dude. Yeah, it was it was good to watch. If you guys awesome. have any, if you guys have any more questions, like, don't feel like you're taking me too long. I, I can answer if there's one more you need on the way out. If not, and you guys are tapped out, you're like, hey, we covered it all. It's been a fucking pleasure, boys. All right, huge thank you to Biz Nasty, Paul Bissonette. What a dude. He's awesome. What a funny guy. Good guy. Awesome. Can't thank him enough yeah, for man. joining us for this big one hundo. Yeah, just uh, been been awesome to watch him grow and, yep. and evolve and uh, you know kind of find his, let me say, his groove. I mean, he has found his groove. He's a man. creative genius, in my opinion. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, props to him and all of his work. He's inspired probably a ton of young athletes and, and, and specifically hockey players around, uh, you know, how to use their platform right. and, 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 you know, and create some sort of uh, um, following and, and content around it. So, um, oh, he's got a following. He's got a following. <laughs> he's right. got a following. And it, he's been a huge, huge inspiration uh, for myself personally. And yeah. I'm just, uh, just just seeing how you can be a fourth line plug and <laughs> still find your way uh, post post career right? yep. uh, in different ways uh, in, in creative ways. So um, big, big thanks. Yes. Thanks again. And we are ready for our clear questions, Nas. Brought to you by Clear Rum. Let's go, baller. What do we got? Over on Instagram, Philadelphia Flyergram wants to know from both of you, what's your favorite Ed Snyder story? I mean, you know, for, for me, when I think of Ed, it's just how much of a professional he was and win or lose – He's in the locker room, uh, home game specifically, uh, in after the game, looking you straight in the eyes and shaking your hand. I just think like that just sticks out to me, you know. Yeah, I know he's a giving man in, in many different ways, you know, in the community, all that great stuff. But I just think of Ed Snyder, just think of like staring you down, like this honest, legitimate, like yeah, man with a ton of integrity, and that's really what jumps to mind when I think of Ed Snyder. Yeah, I mean. That's well said. I mean, he, that's exactly him. Like, win or lose, like you said, he was down there, even if he was pissed off. Yeah. If we played a, if you guys played a bad game, he was still there to thank you, shake your hand, and, hey, we'll we'll be back, you know, we'll get the next, whatever. But he was he was great, and you knew he was going to be there. Yeah. It, it, was, it, was, it was fun to watch, and, you know, obviously there aren't a lot of owners that, yeah. that do that, and it was really cool. Um, one of my favorite things, I, there's a lot, I, I was – fortunate enough to know him a long long time um but one of the, my favorite things was he called me in for a meeting in the summer 
uh, about, he wanted to talk to me about equipment. He wanted me to bring a bunch of shoulder pads and elbow pads to his office. And, um, I get to the, uh, center. I was living when I was living in Philly. I get to the center and I'm like, oh man, like I have short sleeves on, but you know, with my tats, I'm like, he never, I don't think he knew I had tats because I always wore long sleeve, <laughs> right. you know, for games. And, um, I'm like, I don't think you'll care, but like, I, let me, I'll grab a jacket when I get to the, to the center. Well, I get to the center and they had done this big cleaning thing. So everything was out of there. Oh. So I'm like, oh, okay. So I go up for the meeting. I get in there. <laughs> he's like, he's like, come on in Derek. And he's like, have a seat. And I got this bag of uh, hockey equipment and I still don't really know what we're going to talk about. And, uh, he's like, oh man, he's like, it's like, I love your artwork. He's like, wait, tell me what these are. So I like literally sat there for five minutes explaining which every tattoo Not was. And I just thought that was super cool, you yeah. know, like, um, and then on top of that, he wanted, he was trying to work with uh, Gary Bettman with a league on the shoulder pads. Remember when we had to add the protection on the shoulders oh, yeah. and the elbow pads. Right. So yeah. basically every guy had to change their elbow pads and shoulder pads to make yeah. it like an inch and a half thick of foam. Mm -hmm. Well, he felt like, there weren't as many dirty hits when the shoulder pads weren't as thick yeah, I remember because that. guys, they're like, not, maybe you're not going to throw your shoulder yeah. into the boards trying to hit a guy. Yeah. And, and it made a lot of sense. And he was telling me about when he was part owner with the Eagles, which I didn't even know. Yeah, and he was that. telling me about the leather helmet, like all this stuff. He just, the, the man was brilliant, yeah, obviously. Was. And it was just so cool. There's many other stories, but that one really sticks out because – he made me feel comfortable right away about about that. Not that I didn't think he would, but it just, I just thought it was pretty cool. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, a man of integrity. Yes, sure. he was awesome. Yep. Uh, this is from Zoid nineteen seventy two one mm -hmm. over on Twitter. Another one for the two of you. Who would you love to have on the podcast who has no relation to the Flyers? Ooh, great question. I'm gonna throw out a couple big names like Gretter. Which was number two in the running for episode Hundo. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Mark Messier, big fan, uh, idol growing up. Uh, those two jump out right out of the gate. Fopa, oh, he said not Flyers. I was going to say Fopa. I mean, yeah, just because he was a legendary too yeah. in my books. But um, yeah, Gretter, Mess, Mario, top three. Yeah. I would say uh, obviously Gretter. Mm -hmm. Like, we want to try to get him at some point. And, uh, Sidney Crosby. Sidney Crosby. I think it'd be really cool. Be great one. Um, our Philly fans, and uh, you know, they don't love him, but uh, I think it'd be cool to get to sit down with him and talk to him. Yeah, people get to see a side of him that they, you know, they haven't seen, which yeah. I've been lucky enough to see. So yeah, that'd be something. Man. That would be really cool. Yeah, get a perspective from from Sid's stance. Right, what, right. What it's like to come into Philly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I remember him. And their tell, he he told me. Uh, well. I, one time when they beat us out a few years ago uh, in the playoffs, he, he came down and he said, before the game, he said, make sure, you know, LV stays because it was an afternoon game and I'll, I'll come down when I talk to him. And I said, okay. So Sid's the last guy to leave. And, and uh, he like, he's coming down the hallway and he's like, LV yells his name. Yeah. And Elvis is oh, like, yeah. you know, and all these people are like, who's he talking to? And he comes up to LV and he goes, Hey, and he gives him knuckles, right? He goes, were you the guy leading those Crosby sucks chants today? <laughs> And I was like, no, <laughs> and he, yeah. you know, and I was Not like, me. he's just kidding, buddy. But it, uh, he, so you cool. know, he gets it and he likes that. Yeah. He loves it. But anyway, yeah, oh, that's beautiful. Yeah, I'd like, like to get him on. That'd For be sure. great. One more Quinn over on Twitter. Nasty. What's a strange customization request a player has made to you? Hmm. There's a uh, strange customization. Um, Extended tongues. <laughs> <laughs> no, like uh, I think the craziest. And it's not even crazy. It actually happens a lot. I was fortunate not to have a lot of guys. Speaking of Messier with all his movement of his blade, um, our buddy James Van Reemsdyke oh, yeah. is a, is um, pretty particular with his skates, and he likes to change lifts around. He puts these little shims in is what we call them. You know, uh, there's like one maybe this thick on the inside of his skate, but not one on the outside of his skate. Hmm. And, he, and he likes to switch them around and stuff. That was probably one of the – I don't want to say strange, but kind of strange because none of them were equal. Yeah. So, but it, it works for him. Yeah, right. So, it works. Um, yeah, that was probably one that I'd always just be like, I would, you know, pick on him, but I'm like, what in the world are we changing it for today on a game day? You've had them like this for three months. But that was probably one of the things that really stick out in my mind. 
Yeah. Any adjustments to fight straps or anything like that? No, I've done that. I used to, <laughs> I used to, when I was with the Phantoms, I, had, my dad showed me this trick. You used to, you cut, I would cut the jersey and then I would sew it back. I would turn it inside out and sew it. And it was kind of like in a V, but when it was on the player's arm, you couldn't tell, but if someone grabbed you, it went right up your arm uh, because it was opened up, but you couldn't right, right, see it. Right, right. So all our guys had an advantage. Oh man! Um, and like then that. you know they started changing all the rules. You can't alter the jerseys because yeah. of Rob Ray coming, oh, Rob you know, Ray coming out sure. of them and yeah. the Velcro and all that stuff. But I I got away with that for years. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah, good stuff. I put you in a jersey. Going back, looking at your first year, that jersey looked like a goalie jersey. On 33. You. But everybody wanted, like, the big jersey, which yeah. probably would have made more sense for it to be tight. That's what Dave Brown liked. I know, right? He liked it tight so a guy couldn't grab it. Yeah. And then, funny so, enough, the next year they went to those super those tight, tight jerseys. jerseys. Yeah, yeah exactly. It was like, you know, from one extreme to the other. It next was. And... Totally. Your, your, or, that orange, I'd never forget that jersey. I'm like, man, I might be a little too big. Do you remember the, the fight against, or was, was it against Clark? It was against Ashram in preseason when he ripped the whole sleeve right off. Yeah, jersey. Yes. I didn't yep. think that was even possible with a hockey jersey, but um, yeah. yeah, apparently those <laughs> I do remember that. Were, uh, yeah, not as strong as they look, but that's a wrap. Now that's a wrap. One hundred. Can't believe it. We yeah. did it. We did it. We did it. It's awesome. So, thanks so to everyone. Hundo. Yeah, thanks to all the fans, uh, all the support, everyone uh, listening, watching, tuning in. Uh, we appreciate you, and uh, we're gonna be keeping ourselves busy the next. Uh, well, the next. Uh, 100 episodes. I hope so. Hundo. I hope so. So tune in next week, 101. Until then, stay safe, knuckleheads. See ya.